Hey, welcome to this new Tailwind CSS course. My name is Robin. I'm super happy and excited to show you what I think is an amazing CSS framework, Tailwind. So in this course, through one project, you're going to know anything that you need about Tailwind. Okay, you don't need more than one project. Don't spend your time and waste your time on a very long course. Tailwind is pretty easy and generally you're going to learn it pretty quickly. So don't waste your time. In this course, we're going to do one single project, one advanced project, but it's going to cover everything that you need to be really comfortable with Tailwind. I can assure you that at the end of this course, you will be completely comfortable creating your own Tailwind project and building your own application with Tailwind. Now, let me show you what we're going to build exactly. Here it is. So this is the website that we're going to build. It's a kind of Nike e-commerce website, but it's actually just the cart system part. So here, basically, we have selected a shoe that is floating a little bit. And in here, you have all the shoe informations. Then you can select another shoe here on the card. For example, I could select this one, set a quantity and a size and add it to my bag. I can do that for another shoe if I want, for example. And now I have three items in my card. I can open it. There is a slight animation. And then, as you can see here, we have all the items that we have added. I can remove items if I want and I can close the cart. But I just want to show you that the website is going to be 100% responsive. Okay? It's going to behave differently on laptop, on tablet, and on mobile. And as you can see here, we even have a different menu on mobile. Finally, we are going to handle the dark and the light mode. So as you can see here, if I click on this button, it's going to turn the dark mode on. And I can click again, and it's going to turn it off. So through this project, we're going to learn everything about Tailwind, and you're going to be completely comfortable using it. So now in the next video, let's talk about Tailwind, okay? What is Tailwind exactly and why you could possibly need it? So see you in the next one to talk about that. All right, so in this video, we're going to talk about Tailwind. So basically, Tailwind is just a CSS framework. Behind the scene, Tailwind is just made out of CSS. That is why it's going to work with anything, okay? It's going to work for any web project that can support CSS. So traditionally, when you write CSS, you are going to create a class, so you have to find a name, and then inside you're going to write your CSS code, your CSS properties. And you're going to do that for any classes that you want to create. Then in your HTML, you're going to reference this class, for example, like that, in your uh, class or class name attribute, depending if you're using HTML or React. In React, we use class name. Okay, so Tailwind has just created a lot of predefined classes for you. For example, font SM, that is going to be a small font. Okay, there is also a font MD for medium, a font LG for large, and these are predefined classes. Okay, Tailwind has created a lot of classes like that. For example, flex, that is just going to do a display flex, justify center, that is going to do this. Okay, and there are a lot of utilities. So basically, it's exactly like the code that you would have written, so you can use it the same way. For example, you can just reference the classes like that, the utilities, right? Okay, so if you have understood that, well, you have understood 50% of Tailwind, congratulations, Tailwind is just a bunch of classes, but not only. Also, with Tailwind, you're going to develop faster because the utility first approach is going to streamline the design process. Okay, you don't have to think about finding a class name for each style you write. Okay, when you're writing CSS, you basically have to find a name for every style you write. And also it's going to make everything more homogeneous because you have predefined padding, predefined margin, predefined everything actually. And this way you won't have 40 kind of font size in your project, okay? You will have maybe five or six 
different font size that are predefined. This way the code will be homogeneous and you will also have less code in the final bundle. Also, and we have not seen yet how it's going to work, but you'll see that Tywin offers a way to do the responsive in a very simple way. Okay? There are a lot of libraries that try to do that, for example, Bootstrap, but Bootstrap has its own specific way of uh, handling the responsivity. Okay? You have a 12 column system that you have to respect that is very specific to Bootstrap. With Material UI, you have another system with values and properties, etc. But with Tailwind, you'll see that it's super simple to make your application responsive. Also, another cool thing is that Tailwind is performant because it's basically just CSS. You're going to reuse a lot of existing classes, so it's less cut to add in your bundle and less cut to add in your bundle, make your bundle smaller. So when your page load for the first time, it has less code to load, so it's going to load faster. And finally, theming is really simple with Tailwind. You will see that it's just one configuration file and that the dark mode and the light mode is super easy to set up. And also the theming system ensure consistency and an homogeneous application and styling. So we are almost going to start. First, you need to save this link because this is the official Tywin documentation. So let's go on it so it looks like this. So basically, you'll see that sometimes you will wonder, hey, for example, how can I do a flex in Tailwind? Well, it's pretty simple. When you wonder how to do that, you just go in the official documentation, you click in the search and you type flex. Then as you can see here, you have a flex option and then here you're going to end up on the flex documentation. It's going to tell you how to use it, what is going to be the output, the CSS output behind the scene. And then you can have example here and you can test them and resize thing to see how it's behaving. So you have a lot of examples and a lot of use cases for every utilities of Tailwind, okay? But don't worry, you don't have to read the entire documentation to know how Tailwind works, okay? You're going to see that it's easier than it seems. Okay, now one question, why not use, for example, Bootstrap or Material UI, which are great, okay? These are great libraries, Chakra UI, things like that. Well, you still can continue use them. You can even use them in combination of Tailwind, but there is one major drawback using this kind of libraries. And it's about customizing. These libraries are great as long as you are using them without really customizing them. Okay, if you're just updating a color or a size, it's okay. But if you want to really redefine and recustomize the component, well, it takes as much time as recreating it by yourself. But Tailwind has another approach. It provides only the minimum and then you can add what you want. So it's better when you want to customize a lot of things. If you want to to have an application that really looks like Material UI, just use Material UI. If you want to have an application that really looks like Chakra UI, just go with Chakra UI. But if you have your own application with your own look, with your own style, I would really advise you to use something like Tailwind or just plain CSS. Okay, so now we're good with this very brief Tailwind overview, but we're going to use it and really practice in the next one using a sandbox that is provided by Tailwind itself. Okay, so you can again save this link. I'm going to open it as well. And you should end up on something like this. Okay, so on the left here, you have the code that you can write. I'm going to remove everything. And here is going to be the output. So in the next video, we're going to practice and learn the basic utilities. See you in the next one. Okay, so in this video, we're going to talk about Tywin. We're going to try the first utilities. And I'm also going to give you a quick CSS refresher uh, about some properties that I think are often misunderstood, like display. Okay, so let's go into the Tailwind sandbox. Um, so first of all, let's create our first div. Okay, so when you want to write some Tailwind, you have to use the class attribute. And with React, it will be class name, but the code is going to be exactly the same. Don't worry. So first, let's try to create a simple square. So we have to define a height and width. So to do that, we're going to use a utility 
but I just want to show you what you should do by yourself later. If you don't know how to set a height, you just go on the Tywin documentation, like I told you previously, you type height, enter, and it's going to explain you how it's going to work. So basically, it's telling you that you have to start with the letter H, then a dash, and then you can provide a parameter. And this is the output. Also, you have a lot of examples at the bottom. So basically, Tailwind is always going to work this way. It's always a short end, then a dash, and then the parameter. Almost all the time. So for example, here I can type H dash, and then I can type control space, and here are all the predefined values, okay? So you have to use one of these predefined values, otherwise it's not going to work, okay? And later I will show you how to create your custom values, but for now we're going to try to stick to the predefined values. This way you're not adding CSS in the bundle, okay? You're just using something that already exists in the bundle. So for example, let's say I define a height of 12. All right, so you can do exactly the same thing with the widths. And we could now set a background color. Again, you can read on the documentation and you're going to notice that it's with the BG keyword, dash, and then again, you have predefined colors that comes with Tailwind natively. So in general, you have the color and then you have the tint, okay? Uh, and you'll see that we will be able to create our own colors. For now, I'm going to go with the green, 500, that is in general the middle color of the tint. It goes from 0 to 1000 or 900 in general. And tada, you have a square. And I'm going to create two other squares, okay? One that is going to be red and one that is going to be blue. Okay, um, so that's the basics. Okay, so I know it can seem a bit odd that you have to write your CSS in your HTML, uh, and I know that it's probably the opposite of what you've learned all, all your life of developer. Um, but you're not you're going to notice how it's going to make you super productive. And actually, you're not writing CSS here, you're just calling classes, okay? Exactly the way you would have called your own CSS classes. You just don't have to find a name. So yes, you can end up having a long line of code, but don't worry, you can reuse them, there are ways to do that, you can create components out of some Tailwind code, so don't worry. And if you want, you can also mix your Tailwind code with your own CSS, if you want. So don't worry, uh, there are solutions for this kind of problem, if I may say, but you're going to notice that most of the time it's not a problem actually. And so now in the next video we're going to talk about a very specific property that is the display property that is in my opinion often misunderstood so I just want to clarify something and show you how it's going to work with Tailwind. After that we will create our project. See you in the next one. Okay so in this video we're going to talk about the display CSS property and I'm going to show you how it's going to work with Tailwind. So first a quick CSS refresher. So the display property is going to tell you how the elements are going to be display in the layout, how they're going to behave physically. So you have uh, six properties that you can use, block, inline, inline block, non-flex, and grid. Let's start with block. So when an element is in display block, it's going to take the full width, and they're going to be one below each other. Since they're taking the whole space, they don't have the choice, they have to go on the next line. And when an element is block, you can still change its height, change its width, no problem with that. So there are a lot of elements that are block, okay, you have the div, the h1, h2, etc, all the, uh, the titles, p for paragraph, li for the list, and section, okay, all these elements are going to be block by default in HTML. Then you have the display in line. So when an element is displayed in line, they're going to be displayed on the same line and take only the width that they need. And one important thing, you cannot change the height or the width of an element that is displayed in line, okay? So for example, uh, if you try to change the height or the width of a link, a link is by default uh, one of the elements that are in line by default. So if you try to change the height or the width of an A element, it's not going to work. Nothing is going to happen, okay? 
and then you have something that is in the middle of that you have inline block so inline block elements are going to be displayed in line but you can still change their height or their width that's it okay then you have the display none that does not exist in tailwind you have two properties you have invisible and hidden so invisible when you try to make an element invisible for example this one it's just going to be well invisible but it's still going to be there physically okay it's going to still take its own space all right it's just that the cars are not here anymore and also you have the hidden the hidden is going to make the element completely be removed from the dom okay so it won't be there anymore physically so I'm just going to show you how to use all of that quickly in the sandbox, okay? So for example, if I make my elements uh, in line, okay, you're going to notice that they're going to disappear. Because if you remember, I told you that an element that is in line is only going to take the space that it needs. And the space needed is only based on what you have inside the element, okay? I told you that the height and the width are not working when an element is in line. So for example, I have to set something here, okay? Hello, my friend. And all the elements are placed in line. I can also use block, for example, on this element here. And when I do that, well, it's going to go on the next line, okay? And it's going to take the full width by default. So if I remove my width here, you're going to notice that indeed it's going to take the full width, but you can still change the height and the width. Um, so you have also the inline block. So if I do that, I can still change the height, but it's going to be in line like I told you. Then you can make the element invisible if you want. Okay, and for example, I could also, I don't know, make this element hidden here, and it's going to be removed, okay? And so yeah, the inline is not going to do anything if it's hidden. All right, so in the next video, we're just going to talk about flex and grid that we're going to use massively because it's super useful when you want to position your elements easily. Uh, so let's do that in the next one. See you in the next one. Okay, so in this video I'm going to give you a quick refresher about the Flexbox system that is going to allow you to easily position elements. And also I'm going to show you how the grid system works and I'm going to show you obviously how it's going to work with Tailwind. So uh, let's start with the Flexbox system. So generally, Flex is a property that is assigned to the parent element and that is going to be used to position the children. So you can create a class and a Flex like this. As soon as you do that, the elements are going to be positioned horizontally. If you don't want them positioned horizontally, you can specify Flex call, so they're going to be positioned in column, okay? And behind the scene, here is going to do a display flex and here a flex direction column okay <clears throat> then you can use a combination of two properties to position the children so you have justify content uh, and so in tailwind it's just justify and then you can select what you want so if i select justify center it's going to be centered horizontally okay because justify always work in the same direction as flex. So since the flex here by default, as you can see, position the element horizontally, justify is always going to work horizontally. So here, if I say justify end, it's going to put them at the end, but horizontally. Okay. And if I use a flex call like this, the element are vertically stacked. So when I'm going to use justify center, it's also going to follow the same direction and position the element vertically. So for example, if I go with justify center, oh well, it's not working because if I inspect here, as you can see, my page only takes this space. So I have to make the div take the whole screen. So I'm going to use age and you have a property that is age screen like this. Age screen, age screen is going to give one screen of height, okay? And so now, yes, it's working, it's justifying at the center, but vertically, okay? And so you can use start, again, and etc. okay? And you have other properties like justify, for example, um, between. 
So it's going to set a space between each element, R around. And this is going to set a spacing around each item. So we have this space and this space between this item. And we have the same here and here and here and here. Okay, so it's just around the item. That's why you have a big space here and a small one here. Okay? And you even have justify evenly. It is going to set the exact same space between all each elements. So that's about justify. Now, let's say I remove the flex call. I remove the justify evenly. You also have a line items that is a CSS property that is just going to be items with tailwind and then you can position them and move them in the opposite direction of the flex. So for example, here the elements are placed horizontally, so items is going to work vertically. So for example, if I go with item center, they're going to be centered but vertically. And well, you got the idea, okay? So you can basically use start, use end again, etc. And you can use a combination of both. If you want to center it on the screen, you can use center and also add a justify center and tada, you have your item placed placed at the center, okay? If you have understood that about the flex system, you have understand 90% of what we're going to do to position elements, okay? So that's pretty much what you need to know about flex, okay? That's what we're going to do 90% of the time when we, when we try to position something, all right? Okay, so that's it for this quick refresher, and now you know how to use justify and items, okay? Now let's talk about the grid system. So this one is pretty easy. Let's say you have way more items, for example, this. And you want to remove all of that first. Oh, I'm just going to keep the age screen. And yes, you have all your elements like that. And you want to, for example, have a grid of three elements per line. Well, that is super easy. You can just use grid like this and then grid call and you can specify the number of column, for example, three. And tada, you have three elements per line and well, it's just working. And that's pretty much what you have to remember about the grid column system. Okay, and you can change it if you want more items, no problem with that. You can just change the number here, okay? All right, so now that we know that, in the next video, we're going to see how the responsive is going to work. See you in the next one. All right, so now I'm going to show you how to make your application responsive with Tailwind. First thing you have to know is that you have breakpoints provided by Tailwind, okay? And they're these ones. So basically, when you're going to use the keyword SM, it means that you want to apply the code, apply the Tailwind code only when you reach 640 px or bigger, okay, or above. When you're going to type MD, it means that you want to apply the code, the Tailwind code, only for this size or above. Okay, that is very important. When it's bigger or this size, okay. So Tailwind has an approach that is mobile first. Let me give you an example. Here I have several divs, so I'm going to zoom a little bit so you can see. Okay, so just to show you, I'm going to make all these divs invisible, okay? So I'm going to make this one invisible, and I'm going to actually do that for every div. So I'm just going to use Command D or Control D, depending on what you use, and I'm going to write in visible. So now everything is invisible. Now let's say I just want the SM to appear when we reach the SM size, the MD when we reach MD size, it's super easy. So this is going to be applied at all time unless I override it. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say that from SM or above, I want my text to be, sorry, visible like that. And I'm going to do that for every element here, but I'm going to say that this one has to be visible from medium or above. Okay, so here, large, 
Excel and to Excel. To Excel readable. Okay, so uh, I have zoomed a lot, so I don't have the same size as you have probably. So technically, when I'm going to reach 640, the SM should appear. So let's see. When I, I'm 640, yep, as you can see, it appears, okay? And if I continue and reach the other breakpoints, well, I have to unzoom, sorry. Yes, okay, as you can see, it's working. Um, so you don't really see them. So I'm just going to increase a bit the text size. That's a good moment to show you how we're going to do that. So let me show you. I'm going to add a parent div. And since I want the same text size for all my elements, I'm going to put it in the parent. And I'm going to do text. And then with text, you can do a lot of things. You can increase the size. And so basically, you have predefined text size, OK? And again, you're going to use the same kind of keywords. It's L, uh, LG, Excel, etc. It has nothing to do with the responsive, OK? Just the size. So for example, here, I could have a text large, OK? So technically now, my text should be bigger, OK? And if I pass my mouse over, yep, it's that. So I'm just going to make it really, really big. I'm going to go with 4XL. Yes. OK, so now I'm going to unzoom to show you. So now, if I increase the size, as you can see, they are all going to appear one after each other because here, LG, as you can see, it's going to appear when the minimum width is at least the LG size. OK, so if you understood that, you understood pretty much how Tailwind is going to handle the, the responsive in the application, okay? And you can have as much breakpoint rule as you want in one element, okay? So for example, here, I can say that starting from SM, I want it to be visible, but starting from MD, I want the text color to be, for example, red. And starting from LG, well, I want the text to be super big okay and now look at that sm now it's getting red and now it's getting super big okay so that's how you're going to make things responsive and change depending on the screen size if you understood that well you understood how the responsive is going to be handled and so for example uh, i could remove all of that i could remove all my rules here i'm going to remove all of that OK, and I'm just going to give you an example. But for example, I could have my elements to be in flex column by default, like that. And when I'm above small, I want them to be in line. So I'm going to go, go SM and just flex row to force them to be in row, the default behavior. OK, you can pass your mouse over and you can see what's going on. OK, and now look at that. OK, the elements are going to change like this. All right. So that's pretty much what you have to remember for the breakpoints. So we're going to practice that a lot in the project. So don't worry. At the end of this course, you will be completely comfortable using the breakpoints. OK. All right. So that is pretty much it for this video. In the next one, I'm going to show you how you can pass custom values to your elements. See you in the next one. OK, so in this video, we're going to talk about states. States are basically utilities that you can apply when something changes, when the state changes. For example, when you pass your mouse over something or when you click on something, when something is disabled, OK, when, when the state of the element changes, OK? So for example, let's say I create a button. I'm going to call it click me. And inside, I'm going to set a background color. So I'm going to use a predefined color, indigo. Uh, then I'm going to change the text color. So I'm going to use text and then pass my color like this. Then uh, I'm going to use something that we haven't used yet. I'm going to put some margin and some padding. So again, you can look on the documentation, but it's exactly as every other utilities, okay? So for the margin, you have a short end that is just M. OK, and then you can pass something. And for example, I can pass four. And this is going to apply a margin four. 
and you can specify a very specific margin, for example, margin left, okay, or margin right, or margin bottom. It's pretty straightforward. And it's exactly the same thing with the padding. Okay, you can just write a padding to, for example, or just a padding left, like that. Okay, so for this example, I'm just going to do a margin four. It's taking a bit of time. And I'm going to set an horizontal padding that is going to be different from the vertical padding. To do that, I can specify padding X, and you can do the same thing with margin. Padding X, and I'm going to set uh, four, and padding Y, only two, okay? Now maybe I want to round a little bit my button, so I'm going to use the round keyword. That is the same thing as border radius, okay? It's just that you have pretty fine values. And I'm going to set a rounded medium. Okay, okay, now we're here to talk about states, right? So let's say I want to change the color of the button when I pass my mass over. It's pretty simple. So I'm going to choose my state, I'm going to choose hover, and then you can write your utility, okay? So when I pass my mouse over, I'm just going to change the background color and make it a little bit darker, like this. And now, yep, it's working. And you have different states that you can all find on the official documentation, obviously, okay? So over, focus, active, you have a lot of utilities and there is a huge page for this documentation. So you can check it out. So now uh, let's say I want the color to change as well. When I click, I can use the state active. Active, and when I click, I'm going to change again the color, but make it a little bit lighter, 400. And now, yep, when I click, it's going to be super light. And you can do that for any state, okay? And you can mix that obviously with breakpoints if you want, okay? For example, I could say that on a small device or bigger, I want the over to be this color, but on mobile, in general, maybe I want uh, the color to be, I don't know, red, okay? So here I'm going to put that for small and bigger, small and bigger, Okay, and they're all going to be ordered at the end. Okay, when you put breakpoints, Tailwind is going to reorder all the classes using its own convention. Okay, uh, and now I'm going to change the background color. I'm going to make it red, or maybe red, yeah, red, red, red. I'm going to make it red. And when I'm going to click and pass my mass over, it's going to be slightly different. BG red. 600 and when it's active it's going to be bg red 400 all right and now yep it's like that on mobile and when it's getting bigger it's different okay so that's pretty much what you have to know about states it just works like that you just pass your state and then write your utility right after that and again you can look at the documentation to know more about that but you have other states, okay, you have focus as well. For example, I could show you, um, I could add focus, and when it's going to be focus, I could add a ring around, okay? So this is a predefined class, like that, and when I'm going to focus it, as you can see, there is a ring that is going to be added, okay? And as soon as I click elsewhere, it's going to be removed because the button doesn't have the focus anymore. And you can obviously change the color of the ring, by doing something like this, ring, um, probably I can make it, I don't know, green, like that. So now any ring is going to be green on this component. And you also have other kind of states. Okay, there are a lot of states that you can use. I'm just going to give you another example. Let's say you have a list with four, with three elements, sorry. Um, and let's say uh, for each element, you have a class like that. I'm just going to show you. Class, you can target, for example, only the first element. For example, first, I'm going to change the background and make it green like this. As you can see, it's only working for the first element. 
So if you are writing a loop and only have access to one element since you are in a loop, you can write something like that and it's only going to be applied for the first element. And you have other kind of states, okay? You also have, for example, last. So I could have um, last, I'm going to add it last. And you could have a BG blue four and it's going to be applied only for the last. And you even have things to target odd and even elements in a list. For example, I could have odd like this. I'm going to change the BG again, make it purple only for the odd element or I can change it again and it's going to be applied only for the even element. All right. And as you can see, it's the last utility that is going to be used by Tailwind, okay? It's going to override what has been written previously. So as you can see here, the first is going to be applied, but also this one, since this one is after, it's this one that, that is going to be used, all right? So that is pretty much about states. You can look at the documentation to see all other states that you can use, but that's the general idea, okay? All right, so that is pretty much it for this video. I hope it's clear and see you in the next one. All right, so in this video, we're going to talk about the theme and how to use custom values with Tailwind. Here I have a button, okay? And for now, I'm just using this background color. That is a pretty fine color. Maybe you want to use your own color. So you have two ways of doing that. You can first declare a custom value on the fly, just like that. So anytime you want to create a custom value, for example, let's say I want to use um, this color, okay? This is a kind of mint color. Uh, if I want to use that, basically, and this is going to work for any utility, anytime you want to use a custom value instead of a value, so for example, in this utility here, the value is green 500, okay? You can just use brackets like that and pass your value. And as soon as you do that, it's going to work and it's going to be replaced by, by the valid CSS, okay? Uh, and this is working for any kind of utility. For example, in px4, 4 is the value. So here I can replace it by brackets if I want and pass a custom value. Obviously, it has to be valid CSS, okay? I'm not going to send a color for a px, otherwise, well, it's going to generate the CSS, but it's not going to be a valid CSS. So make sure to pass a value that makes sense. And just to show you, but by default for px, I have some predefined values, but I don't have a px13, okay? So if I go there, as you can see, px12 is a 3 REM padding and the 14 is a 3.5. Let's say I want a 3.2, I can just use brackets again and pass a 3.2 REM and it's going to work because this is valid CSS, okay? And as you can see, anything that you're going to pass in the brackets here is going to be replaced in the CSS. And you can do that for any utility, okay? Rounded here, uh, as you can see, it receives a value that is this one. So I have predefined values like uh, XXL, for example. And again, I can replace it. For example, I could write 300 px and ta-da, my custom value is passed, okay? So this is cool. That's how you're going to be able to create custom values. But uh, for example, this color, maybe you want to reuse it somewhere else, okay? If you're just using it just once like that, that's perfect. Just use a custom value on the fly. Otherwise, maybe you want to add it to your theme. This way you can reuse it easily. I'm going to show you how. So when you're going to create a Tailwind CSS project, and I will show you after how to do that, obviously, you will have a configuration file that is this one by default, okay? Uh, so it's a bunch of keys uh, and values. And here you can, for example, create a new color. So you're going to do that in the extend key that is in theme. And if you go on the documentation on theme configuration, they explain everything about the theme. And at the end, I think they show you all the keys that you can use, all right? Um, so for example, you can use colors. And here you're going to be able to create a custom color. And that's pretty easy. You just have to create a name. For example, I'm going to call mine mint and then a value. And ta-da, 
here. Now I can just go there. And now I have BG Mint that exists. So that's how you're going to create a color, for example. Um, generally, you don't have only one color. Okay, you, you want to create a shade of colors in general. Okay, so to do that, that's pretty simple. Instead of passing the color directly like that, you're going to create an object and here you can pass other values. For example, I could have the shade 50. That would be, for example, a value. So I could have 500, etc. Um, okay, so it could be another color, but it doesn't matter. I just want to show you that now here, so BG Mint uh, is not found, but BG Mint 50 or 500 exists. Okay, and did I made something wrong? Yes. Okay, so that's how you're going to be able to create a shade of color. Um, there is a website that exists that allows you to create easily uh, a palette for your color. So I'm using this one, it's Tailwind CSS Color Generator. Basically you pass uh, your color. So for example, I'm going to pass this one. Uh, so basically you can see how it looks like. You can see all the different shades used uh, in the page. And you can export here the Tailwind color configuration. And it's going to provide a name by default. I'm going to keep my name, but I'm going to take all the values here and just go in there, go in my config, and replace all the values here. And tada, now you have a working palette that you can use. And now I have the BG Min 50 and all the colors and all the shades. So pretty useful. And it's super simple to create a color, right? Uh, now I, I want to show you that you can also create a default value. Uh, for example, here, if I just type BG Mint, it's not working, okay? Uh, because it doesn't exist as a key, um, but you can actually do that, okay? If you want to have a default color for BG Mint without values, you can just go there and here, I'm just going to create a default key. And here you can pass your value. For example, I could pass this one. I'm going to save and now BG Mint exists, it's working and it has a default value, okay? All right, um, so this is working for colors. That's how you're going to be able to create a theme for your colors, but you can do that for a lot of other values, okay? For example, if you go into documentation, you'll see that you also have spacing. And here, I could create a custom spacing. So you remember uh, here, I had to pass a custom value here, okay? Uh, because I just have a 12 and a 14. Maybe I want to create my 13. So that's pretty simple. Here, I'm just going to create a new key that is going to be 13 and say that the value is going to be 3.2 REM, like that. And now we have a PX13 that is working fine and that is 3.2 REM, okay? So that's how you're going to be able to customize your theme super easily um, and you can find all the documentation here, it's pretty straightforward. It explains that you can create colors, like I just showed you. You can pass default font family, default, default spacing, etc. default border radius if you want. Uh, so you can do anything that you want. You can create other keys, other values for your theme. So that's pretty much it. That's pretty much how you're going to be able to customize your theme. Uh, if you go into the documentation, you'll find other keys, other ways to uh, change your theme. Uh, for example, you can change the font family by default, you can change the border radius, you have a lot of keys that you can use, but in general, that is always the same ID, okay? You just create a key, a value, and it's going to exist as utility after that, okay? All right, uh, so that's pretty much it for that. In the next video, we're going to talk about what we see here, okay? The Tailwind base component utilities that is technically in a CSS file that is going to be generated when we create a Tailwind project. So we're going to see that. See you in the next one. All right, so in this video, we're going to talk about directives. So uh, here I have very simple HTML content. And the first thing you're going to notice is that all my elements have the same style. Basically, they have no style, actually. Uh, even if we have an H1, an H2, a paragraph, etc., they all have the same style which is not the default behavior 
in HTML, okay, and CSS. Uh, this is because of Tailwind. Tailwind is going to remove all the basic style, all the default style uh, that are applied in your browser. This way, you are sure that you have only the style that you need and you don't have any conflict in between your styles. So this is done in the CSS file that is going to be generated by default by Tailwind. And inside you're going to find these three directives, Tailwind Days, Tailwind Components, and Tailwind Utilities. This is basically injecting a lot of Tailwind code, a lot of CSS code into your project. That's why you don't have the styles anymore. That's why you have access to all the utilities that we have discovered together. Now, you're going to use these directives and you're going to be able to customize them, okay? So we have three utilities that we can override. Technically, it doesn't matter which one you override, it's just about organization, okay? Let me explain. Let's say here you want to have a default style for your h1, your h2, your paragraph, so the default tags that you have in HTML. Well, you're going to override the base directive if you want to do that. Let me show you how. So let's say I want all my h1 and h2 have a very specific size and font size. What I'm going to do is I'm going to override the base layer, okay? To do that, I'm going to type commercial a layer, then I'm going to target the base directive, and inside I'm going to be able to write custom CSS or even apply some Tailwind rules. And I'm going to be able to target all my H1, like that, I'm not sure we need two dots like that, and then I can use the apply directive to be able to inject some Tailwind code in all my H1. For example, I can say that all my H1 should have a 4XL and a font bold, like that. And I can do the same thing for my H2. For example, apply text, and I'm going to write 2XL font semi bold, for example. And as you can see, they are all updated. Okay? And you can do the same thing, for example, for your paragraph apply, and you can write Tailwind here, okay, so for example, again, text, gray, 400, for example, okay? So if you want to have default styles for your tags, maybe that's here that you should do it, okay? And the cool thing is that you can write Tailwind, but you can also uh, write custom CSS if you want, okay? So here I could say that I want the background color to be red, okay? You can mix Tailwind and CSS if you want, there is nothing that prevents you from doing that, and that's perfectly okay. I tend to try to use only Tailwind when I'm in a Tailwind project, okay? Uh, but if you like CSS as well, you can also write CSS. So that's how you're going to be able to override the base CSS for your application, okay? Now you can also create what we call components, which is pretty cool. Let me show you. Let's say we have a button here and uh, I'm going to call it delete, and I'm going to add some style to it. For example, I'm going to add a BG red, uh, 500. I'm going to add a PX4, a, PA, a PY2, sorry. Uh, and I'm going to make it round, and I'm going to change the text color, and I'm also going to add an hover effect. So I'm just going to change the, the background, for example, BT red uh, 600, yep, uh, oops, sorry, I forgot the hover, okay, and I wrote it here, sorry. Okay, so we have a delete button here, and maybe somewhere else in my application, I want to have another button that does the exact same thing, and I don't want to repeat the code. So, to prevent that, you can create a Tailwind component. Uh, so you can go in your CSS, and here you're going to create your layer component. Now inside you can create a custom class. For example, um, button danger. And again, you can write and apply. And paste all your code. You don't need to do that, sorry. And technically now, you can remove all of that 
and just do a button danger and you're good you've just created a component with tailwind now you have one last layer that you can use and it's the layer directive directives so this one is used to create um, kind of directives that you want to reuse to facilitate uh, your development. For example, if I have, I don't know, here a div with a paragraph that says, hi, let's say I have a class. I'm going to add a little blue background. I'm going to make it big. Okay. And let's say I want to center my high here. I'm just going to do a flex, then I'm going to do a um, items center, and finally a justify center. So my element is centered in my box. And you're going to notice that we're going to use a lot the combination of flex, item center, and justify center. So maybe we could create a utility out of that. So I'm going to remove that, remove that, and in my directives, I'm going to create a new one that I'm going to call flex center, for example. And again, it works the same way. You just write your um, Tywin right after your apply like this. And now anywhere you can use flex center and it's going to work. So it's basically the same thing, okay, as components, for example. Here, you're just creating a class and reusing it. That's the same thing. It's just that for organization, you split them, okay? These are just the directives, these are just the components, and here, these are the basic style applied to your tags, okay? So that is pretty much it about the directives that you have here. Um, yeah, I hope it's clear, and obviously we're going to practice that in the real project. So see you in the next one. Okay, in this video, I'm going to show you how to toggle the dark mode and how to style your components so they support the dark mode. Uh, so in this example here, I just have a div that is going to be a card. Uh, it's not ready yet, but it, it just contain three text and a button, okay? Uh, and it's wrapped by another div. So I'm just going to center all of that first. Uh, so in this outer div, I'm just going to do a flex. Uh, I'm going to do an H screen, so it takes the full height. And I'm going to center that. So item center and justify center. And if you already have the flex center utilities that you have created with me in the previous video, you can use it. Okay, so it's centered. Cool, cool, cool. I'm just going to add a bit of shadow. So to do that, I'm going to use shadow and we have predefined shadow values. So I'm just going to use a large shadow like that. Okay, cool, um, and well, that should be enough for now. Okay, now let's say I want to make this component support the dark mode. So the first thing I want is to change the background color of my card when I go to the dark mode. So to do that, that's pretty simple. By default, as you can see, we have set it to white. If I want to make it dark when it's in dark mode, I have to use the dark utility like this. And then, well, you can write any kind of utility right after that. For example, I could say BG uh, Indigo 950 if I want. Okay, so now that we have added this dark rule, technically it should override this as soon as we move to the dark mode. Okay, for example, I could add another one and um, I don't know, make the, the um, shadow, for example, smaller when we are in dark mode. So I would go shadow and I would make it small, okay? Now, how to toggle the dark mode? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to go in the config and at the top of the config, outside of theme, you have to add the dark mode and tell Tailwind that it can toggle the dark mode using a class, okay? <clears throat> and then, well, we just have to toggle a class and we're going to add a class dark to the HTML root component. So basically here, I'm just going to do it manually and then we'll see how to do it programmatically. 
if I inspect my small page here, as you can see, I have an HTML element. So I'm going to edit it. Okay, and I'm just going to add a class. And I'm going to set dark like that. And as soon as you do that, you are enabling the dark mode. So I know that since it's a knife frame, it's uh, sometimes buggy. So I'm just going to close that. Okay, when I close, it's working. So as you can see, yes, the dark mode is now enabled. And now this is overriding what we have uh, here. So cool, now we can just add some other uh, dark mode rules. So for example, the title, the title could be white, for example. So dark um, text white, yes. And I'm just going to make this a little bit lighter. So for example, here, dark text gray, I don't know, 400, uh, oops, like that. Okay, for example, why not? Cool, so this is working. Now, if I want to do that programmatically, and well, obviously we want to do that, I'm just going to add non-click here. And so basically I'm just here going to add an event handler to toggle the dark class and remove it or add it as soon as I click. So here I'm just going to target the HTML element. So document dot document element. This is basically the HTML element. And I'm going to access the class list and I'm going to toggle the class called dark. And so it's going to add dark and remove it, add dark and remove it since we're using the toggle function. And now, yep, it's working. And this would work in the entire application, okay? Anything that has a dark rule will be updated. All right, so as you can see, handling the dark mode is super easy with Tailwind. Okay, so I think that we really have all the basics to start working on our project to practice. So I hope it's clear and see you in the next one. All right, so in this video, I just want to show you how you can access the code for each video that you're going to watch. So uh, first thing first, you can, if you want, save and bookmark one specific repository, and it's this one, Tailwind CSS Shoes. This is the one that we're going to use during the course, okay? And here you can basically choose which branch you want. So for example, if I click on this one, the 15 dark mode, you have access to the old code and you can use it to copy paste some code if you want, or to find the source of your error by copy pasting something. Uh, when you're going to watch the videos, basically you have a resource folder for almost each video all the videos where I'm writing code. And basically you just click and click on Git branch and you should be redirected to the correct Git branch here, okay? And if you want to test and run the code, that is pretty simple. You just have to copy the name of the branch. It's at the end of the URL. And then you can open a terminal. You move wherever you want, okay? I'm going to go on my desktop. And if I want to download the project, I'm just going to do git clone dash b for branch. Then I'm going to paste the branch name. And finally, you have to paste the repository URL. And you can access it by clicking on the code button here and clicking here on copy. And then you can paste it here. While doing that, you're going to download the project. Once it's downloaded, you can just move into it. So I'm going to go in Tailwind CSS. This is the correct branch, that's fine. And then you can just type npm i to install all the dependencies. And once it's done, you can just type npm run dev to run the project. And you're good, you can start it. So that's pretty much how you can access the code. Now, if there is something uh, that you don't understand or if you have a question about something, uh, you can always ask me a question directly from Udemy, okay? I'm the only one receiving the question and I usually answer in maximum 24 hours, okay? In general, I receive the question directly on my mobile so I can answer directly, okay? So if you are 
asking me a question, uh, leaving a review, uh, leaving uh, a mark or something like that, I'm the only one receiving it, okay? And I will always answer as fast as I can. Uh, so I hope you will enjoy this course and happy viewing. All right, so in this video, we're going to set up the Tailwind plus React project using Vit. So the first thing you can do is go on the official documentation, go in get started, and then we're going to go in framework guides. And we're going to choose Vit, which is a pretty cool framework for React projects. And basically you just have to copy paste almost everything. So we're just going to set up um, Vit project. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to move uh, on my desktop, but you can move wherever you want your project to be. So I'm going to copy the first line and I'm just going to replace here my project with the name of my project. So I'm going to call it, for example, Tailwind Shoes, since we're going to do a shoes website. Uh, and as you can see, we're using the template React. So it's going to generate a React plus Vit project. I'm going to run that, it's over. Then I can move in my project, all right. So I'm just going to do CD and then Tailwind Shoes, okay. Then we have to install some libraries Tailwind CSS included, obviously. So we're going to install what is required. And after that, we're going to run a script that is going to initialize a Tailwind config file. So we just have to wait for this to finish. Okay, and then I can run this command. Good, technically now Tailwind config.js has been generated and if I look at what I have in my project, yep, it's here, all right. Uh, well, technically I could open this project in my VS Code, so I'm going to go in my VS Code, open folder, and I'm going to go on my desktop, Tailwind Shoes, and here it is, okay. Then, 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 then uh, we have to copy this Tailwind config file. So what's inside? So if you go in Tailwind config, as you can see for now, it's empty. And basically we have to tell Tailwind where we're going to use Tailwind in the project. So I'm going to copy the all um, config file. And as you can see, Tailwind is going to be enabled in this file and all files that are in the source folder. So that's perfect for us. We're just going to work in the source folder. So that's perfect. So now Tailwind should be enabled. Great, but we still miss something. We have to add the default utilities, the default directives, sorry, uh, into our index.css, the global index.css that is technically loaded when the application starts. So if I go in source, we have an index.css that already exists and we're going to remove everything that is inside and just paste the directives. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to remove the app.css that is here um, and we're going to remove almost everything we have in the app.jsx. We're going to remove that and technically in the end, you should just have something like this, okay? Okay, so uh, now technically Tailwind is working. Technically the project should already be able to run, okay? So if I um, just start the project, so I'm going to go at the root of my project and type npm run dev. Uh, I can click there with control and click and tada, you have your project working. So cool. Uh, as you can see, it's running on a part that is 500, 173. I don't really like that. I like my application to run on the port 3000. So I'm just going to go in vid config and here I'm just going to add a piece of config. Uh, and it's, 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 it's server, I think, yes and port, and I'm going to set it to 3000. And I think that technically now, yes, the application run on 3000. So we are almost good. Um, 
now, 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 well, just because I'm used to have the same structure in my React project, I like the main.jsx to be called index.jsx. It's just me, okay, if you don't want to do that, you don't have to. So I like to call it index.jsx. And <clears throat> uh, since I have renamed it here, and it's called in the index.html here, I have to rename it here as well, so it's still working, okay? Uh, now, in the index.jsx, so this is purely React configuration that is not important at the moment, but basically you can just remove the strict mode. If you know React, you know what I am doing that. If you don't know React, it doesn't matter. You don't need to learn React to understand this course, okay? And then you can remove anything that is uh, not used anymore. As you can see here, the index.css is loaded so this is called, this is the first file that is called when the application starts. So the index.css is going to be loaded and inside we have the Tailwind directive. So we should have Tailwind now. Okay, so let's go in app.jsx and make sure that we have Tailwind. So here I'm going to write my first div. I'm going to write hello Tailwind friends. And I'm just going to add a Tailwind class. So with React, it's not class, it's just class name. That's the only difference that you're going to notice. And now, technically, I should be able to write some Tailwind. And I would like to do, for example, something like that. And let's see, yep, it seems to be working fine. Um, now you probably notice that you don't have the auto completion when typing, like me, for example, here. As you can see, I have the Tailwind auto-completion. If you don't have that, you need a plugin. So you can go in extension, and I would suggest two plugins. I would suggest, um, well, 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 where is it? Tailwind CSS IntelliSense. This one is just a must have, okay? This is going to give you the IntelliSense, okay? The auto-completion for when you type. So pretty mandatory. And uh, is there another one? Yes, you should also install Post CSS language support. Why? Well, because when you're going to type in your CSS file something like uh, commercial A apply, you remember uh, something like that. For example, if you try to write something like this, well, this is not going to be recognized if you don't have this extension. So you need the extension because this is Post CSS. Okay, so technically now, well, we are pretty much good to start. One last thing, and again, it's just purely React and JavaScript uh, configuration, but I don't like to have my functions exported by default and imported by default. Okay, if you don't know why, it's not important for this course. Okay, it's just for the configuration. So I'm just going to remove that and just do a classic export like that. And I'm going to go in my index.js x. And now I cannot do an import like that because this would work only for default import. But now I have a named import like this. And technically if I control and click, I should end up here, which is perfect. Okay. Oh, and by the way, uh, in this video, we're going to use images for our project to look like uh, something. And um, I'm going to share with you all the images right now. So I'm going to attach a link to this video and it's zipped with all the images. So technically you should have something like this, an assets.zip. You can unzip everything and take all the images and put them into your assets folder like that. And by the way, you can remove the react.svg. We're not going to use this one. And technically, you should have several images like that, okay? All right, so technically, you have anything you need for this project, all right? Okay, so see you in the next one to start working. Okay, so let's start by displaying the icon that we have here, the logo, and this icon button. Uh, so first thing first, we unfortunately have to install another extra library to be able to display SVG and also for you to have um, the prettier working, okay? Uh, you'll notice that when I do something like this and save, automatically everything is formatted correctly. So uh, we're going to run 
and install and install three libraries. So you can go at the root of your project and do an npm install dash d, so it's only for development. Um, and then you can install Prettier, Prettier plugin Gwin CSS, and Vit plugin SVGR that is going to allow us to display an SVG. So you can run all of that. I'm just going to make it a little bit bigger so it fits on one line. Okay. All right, so I'm good. Now I can restart my project. Okay, so we have what we need. Now we just need a small piece of config here in the config, we have to add this little plugin to display SVGs. I know, that's how Vit works. So we're going to import, uh, I think it's SVGR from SVG, yes, this. And we're going to call it, it's a function, that's how Vit works, like that. Okay, and make sure we don't have any error. Seems fine, okay. Technically we have anything we need. Now, just to make sure that Prettier is working for you when you save, you can type command shift P or control shift P and go in preference, JSON, yes, and make sure you have uh, you have format unsafe, like this editor.format unsafe to true. If not, you can add it. And finally, you can uh, try to mess a bit with your code, like that, and type command shift P or control shift P, format, choose format document with, and then configure default formatter, and you can choose prettier. And now technically when you're going to save, everything should be formatted correctly, okay? All right, so this was just a video for an extra installation. In the next one, let's start working on the navigation. Let's do that in the next one. All right, so now let's work on this part. Okay, let's display the logo and then an icode button. So uh, we're going to remove this in app and let's remove this. Okay, so technically we should be able to start working and start creating our nav here, okay? But uh, just so we split a bit the components that we're going to create, we're going to create components, okay? And we're going to create a component for the navigation. So I'm going to create a folder that I'm going to call components. And inside, I'm going to create a nav.jsx that is just going to contain the nav code. So I'm going to uh, remove that for now. I'm going to copy exactly what I have in app and I'm going to rename that nav, okay? And now inside my app, I'm going to call my nav component like this. Now all the code that is in nav is going to be this. All right, so basically this can be a nav, okay? This is a built-in component in HTML. Now, the first thing we're going to do is to display the Nike logo. So to do that, we're going to import it. So to import it, we can name it exactly like we want. So I'm going to call it Night Logo, and we're going to get it from assets slash is a Nike Logo dot SVG. And this is uh, specific to Vit, but if it's uh, an SVG like that, you have to use question mark React like this. And this is going to create a kind of React component, but for the SVG. So basically we can call it like a component, like that. And as soon as we do that, as you can see, it's displayed. So um, now we could change a bit the size of the logo. So I'm going to add a class name here. Uh, and I'm going to set an age of 20 and a width of 20, like this. So it's a bit bigger. Okay, so this will later be a link, okay? so. We're going to surround this with an A element. And for now, we're going to set an empty link like this. But this way, it's clickable and it should redirect to the index page. Okay? Um, great, great, great. So this is going to be our logo. So I'm just going to add a small comment here. This is the logo. Okay, so now we want to create a button. So we're going to create a button like that. Um, and inside we want an icon. So again, I'm sorry, but we're going to install a library to have a lot of icons uh, that we can use. So pretty simple, just go into your console again, and we're going to do an npm i react icons. I really like this library because there is a lot of icons that you can use super easily. And then I'm going to restart my project. Okay, and now here I can basically import a component, a component that is going to be my icon, and it's going to be 
RX, uh, I think it's hamburger menu, and you can find all the icons on the React icons documentation. And it's from React icons from the set RX, like this. And this gives us a component that we can use inside our button. And tada, as you can see, it's displayed here. It's just a bit small. So I'm going to increase the size to 25, like that. Okay. Um, and now for the button, well, we want them on the same line. So the nav should be flex. This way, all the elements are on the same line. And we want them uh, apart from each other. So I'm going to do uh, justify between. Okay, cool. Um, and I'm going to center it to make sure that it's perfectly aligned. So I'm going to use item center. But well, nothing seems to change. It's already aligned. Um, okay, now we maybe need a little bit of padding around the application to breathe a little bit. So we're not going to do that in the nav because we want the padding to be for the whole application. So we're going to go in app here. And here we're going to set a bit of padding. 10. So a global padding of 10. Okay. And when I pass my mouse over, you can see what's going on behind the scene. Okay, that's better. So that's fine, but on a large screen, I would like to have a bigger padding, okay? Um, if you go on the, on the website, you'll notice that here the padding is bigger when we are in full screen, I mean on large screen, and it's smaller on smaller screen. So here, we're going to say that by default, yes, we want 10, but we just want to change the horizontal padding and make it bigger on large screen. So when we're going to be on super large screen, I'm going to set a PX of 24. And now technically when I'm going to resize, yes, it's bigger. Okay, so we're breathing, cool. Now for my button, I'm just going to change it a bit, okay? So I'm going to add a ring when I click on it. So basically, I'm going to say that when I'm focused, I want the ring to be of size two. And when I'm focused, I want the ring to be gray uh, 200. And now technically when I click, yep, it's here. All right, so it's cool, but it's a bit too close from the icon. So I'm just going to add a small padding like this. And yes, that's better. Now I'm going to round the border. So I'm just going to use a rounded and I'm going to really make it round with LG. Yep, better. Okay, and when I pass my mouse over, I want a small effect. So over BG gray 100. Yep, better. All right, so that's pretty much what we want. So I'm just going to add a comment here so we really see what this is and it's the burger button. Okay, after that, we're going to create the list. So see you in the next one to do that. Okay, so let's build the list that we have here. So as you can see, we have several links. So maybe we can start by creating an array containing all the values. This way we will be able to loop on over the array and then display uh, an, a list element. So at the top here, I'm going to create a root, that is an array, that is going to contain all my values. So I will have home, about, services, pricing, and contact, for example. Okay, now here I'm going to um, first create a div. And I want this div, I want the list to take the full available width, right? So I'm going to create a class name and I'm going to say that I want this to take the full width. Okay. Now I'm going to create a list. So it's going to be a UL with several LI like that. Okay. But we're going to use a loop to do that. So um, first let's add a bit of um, background here. So I'm going to add a background gray 50. Uh, and I'm going to already loop over my elements so we can see them. So here, I'm just going to do a root dot map. 
So this is a root, and for each root, I'm going to return an element. And inside, I'm just going to write the root, like this. And don't forget to return the element. So if you save, everything is going to go on the right. For now, this box here is trying to take the full width, which is fine, um, but it cannot expand, okay, because of these elements. So we can use the flex wrap property, which is going to make the element go at the next line if it hasn't enough space to expand. Like this, okay? So we need that. Uh, so since we are in a loop with React, you are forced to send a unique key. So I'm just going to set the root name as key, otherwise we will have a warning in the console. Okay, so maybe first on the li element, we can add a class name and add a bit of padding. So I'm going to add a bit of uh, padding, maybe two, yes, and a px three. Okay, okay, then for all the elements, I'm going to set the text to large. Yes, since this is the parent element, this is applied for all the children by default. I'm going to add a slight border around just so we can distinguish the border. So I'm going to write border and then border and I'm going to set a color. So I'm going to write gray 100. So it's barely visible, but it's here. Then I'm going to round the corner. So I'm going to use rounded and I'm going to use um, an LG, yes, an LG border. Okay, I'm just going to add a bit of padding, so maybe four, yes, like that. So it's a bit more um, inside. Then just for the test, for the first element, I'm going to set a background that is blue, okay? Like I did here, okay? So to do that, well, what I'm going to do is instead of writing plain string here, I'm going to use an object, and send back quotes. Okay, so this is what we call a template literal. And this way we can write JavaScript inside this string. And basically I'm going to add a background blue only if it's the first element of the loop. So in my map here, I have access to the current index. So what I can do is I can just check if i is equal to zero, it means the first element, then I'm going to return some tailwind. And I'm just going to do a BG, oh, I have to use back, uh, double quotes. And I'm going to use BG blue 500. Otherwise, for now, nothing. And yes, okay, it's working. Cool, uh, so when this happens, I also want to write the text in white. So I'm going to also write text White. Yes. Okay. Uh, also, for all the elements, um, they will have an over effect. So here there won't be any over effect, but for all the other elements, when you over, there will be a slight PG gray 100. This way, yes, there is a slight PG, but not for this one. Cool. Then maybe you want your mouse to display the little hand to show that this is clickable. So for all the elements, I'm going to add a cursor pointer. And yes, that's better. Cool, maybe I could round that a little bit. So I'm going to add for all the elements a rounded. And I'm not going to specify a size, I'm going to take the basic rounded value the default one. Okay, not bad. So now if I resize, well, okay, for now it's exactly the same thing on uh, laptop, but well, that's a start. So good, so through this video, you saw that you can actually write conditional tailwind, which is pretty cool. We're doing it with React, but you could do it with uh, plain JavaScript that would work as well. Okay, so that's cool, but in the next video, we're going to try to change 
the behavior here, the layout, when we get bigger. Okay, when it gets bigger at a certain point, it completely changes. Okay, it just aligns with all the elements. Okay, so let's do that in the next one. Okay, so in this video, we're going to handle two things. The first one is to handle the visibility of the menu on mobile. Okay, so when we're going to click, it's going to show and hide. And you're going to notice that at the bottom left, we're also going to have a button that is going to be the cart button. So it's going to be displayed at the bottom left. Uh, and also the all layout is going to change when you're going to move to a larger screen. When you're going to move to a larger screen, it's going to change, okay? So the button here is going to be aligned with the menu that is going to be in line here, okay? So let's work on that. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is to create the button here, the cart button. So you can move at the, the end of the nav here, and we're going to create the button here. So um, maybe I can suggest an extension that you can install, that is React Icons. So there are several, so make sure to download the correct one. Uh, and it's, so it's this one. At the moment, it's the blue one, React Icons Auto Import. So this one is pretty cool because it allows you to um, find an icon and also auto import it. Let me show you. For example, here, so I have added the extension in my bar. Here you can, for example, type, uh, I don't know, uh, shopping bag, you okay, know, maybe shopping bag like that. Okay, shopping bag, and several icons are going to be offered. And here I'm going to choose this one. So I'm going to click import, and you're going to notice that automatically it's going to insert uh, the component where my mouse is, and also it's going to add the import at the very top. So it's super cool when you want to add icons super quickly in your project. Okay, so, well, I'm going to use this one and I'm going to wrap it with a div. So first uh, I would like a circle, a white circle. So I'm going to add a class name here uh, and I'm going to do a rounded full like that. I'm going to set the background to white and I'm going to add a bit of shadow. So I'm going to add shadow uh, MD like that. Okay, so uh, you cannot really see it, but um, it seems like the shadow is just uh, really, really close to the shopping bag. It's because we need some space in the circle. So I should add a size here. Like that, yes. Okay, as you can see now there is a circle, but my bag is not center in the circle. It's at the top left, which is the default behavior. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make that flex and then justify center and align the items at the center. You remember, I told you that we can create uh, a shortcut for that. So I'm going to go in my index.css here and I'm going to do exactly like I did when I show you the basics of Tailwind, and we're just going to add a new utility. So utility is like that, and we're going to call it flex center. Flex center, and it's just going to be a short end for 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 a flex, an item center, and a justify center. Okay. Now I have my utility. Oh, I wrote layout, but it's a layer. Sorry. Okay, now technically I should be able to do a flex center like that and tada, my element is center in my circle, which is fine. Cool. Oh, it's cool, but it's not positioned correctly. I want that to be at the bottom uh, left. So to do that, I'm going to create another div around all of that. And I'm going to tell that I want this to be fixed. So I'm going to tell that this is fixed and I'm going to put it at the very specific position. I'm going to put it at left four. So four from the left and four from the bottom. Like that. And tada, 
Now, even if I resize, it's always going to stay at the same position, which is perfect. It's good, but on a larger screen, I don't want this to be positioned in a fixed way. Okay, I want this to be static, so a regular, the regular default position. So I'm going to write LG, so for larger screen and above, I'm going to make that static, which is the default position. So now, as you can see, it's positioned correctly. So obviously at the end, it's not going to be there, but uh, you'll see that it's going to help us after. Okay, now the next step is to basically completely remove this button on larger screen. We don't want that at all. So we're just going to go on the button and we're going to say that on larger screen, it's going to be hidden, okay? Now, yep, it's not there anymore, cool. Now we have to handle that, okay? This should be on in a row on larger screen and like that on mobile. So how are we going to do that? Well, there are several ways of doing that, but this is what I'm going to choose. Basically, we're going to uh, use the flex call and flex row property to change that. So it means that the UL should now be flex. But if we do that, it's going to be by default horizontally displayed on mobile. And we don't want that. We want that to be by default in column. So we're back to what we had before. Now we just want to change that when we are on larger screen. So we just have to do LG and then flex a row. So as soon as we're going to reach Large is going to move to that. So let's save. So now technically I'm like that on mobile. And yes, like this on um, larger screen. I'm going to say desktop, on desktop. Um, okay, now we want this not to take the full width when we are on desktop, okay? Otherwise it's going to move to the next line and we don't want that. So we have to remove the width full here. So it's, it's going to be all the time with full, unless we are on a larger screen. Otherwise, we're just going to take the widths that we need. So widths auto, which is the default width. So let's see. And ta-da, it's just taking the width that it needs. Cool. And remember that by default, uh, we said that we want all the element to be item center and justify between. So that's why you have a space between the elements here. Okay, cool. Well, we're almost good. We just need to remove a bit of CSS here. So the background, the border, and the background here. So this should be pretty easy. So here we have a BG gray, but on larger screen, we just want the BG to be transparent like that. So, yep, no more background. We're going to do the same thing with the border. So we should have a border somewhere, yes, here. Well, we're just going to change that and say that on larger screen and above, we want the border to be none. Okay, so technically it's at the end, yes, right there. And okay, very nice. Okay, uh, now we're going to remove uh, the blue background here and just color the text in blue instead. So here, instead of doing that, on larger screen and above, we are going to BG transparent. Yes. And here the text is white, so we're not seeing the, uh, the, the home anymore. So we're just going to do a large text uh, blue 500. This way we can see that it's selected. Okay, so cool. Now we could just add a bit of spacing between all these li. So to do that, we can go on the parent element and use the property space x that is going to add some space between all the children. So it's space x. Uh, and we could add, for example, I don't know, eight, but be careful, we just want to do that on desktop, not on mobile here, okay? So I'm going to 
write LG like this. Save, and yeah, that's way better. Okay, cool, so now maybe we could just handle the visibility here when we click. So that is pretty simple. We're going to need for that some JavaScript. So with React, we're going to need a variable. So I'm going to write um, a state. If you don't know exactly how React works, just bear with me, it's going to be pretty simple. We're going to have a variable for when uh, the menu is displayed. So is mobile menu shown? And we have a function to update this value. By default, it's not going to be shown at all. Okay, I'm going to import that. It comes from React. And basically, uh, oh, I forgot the E. Set mobile. Okay. So basically, now we can use this variable uh, to display the menu or not. So by default, uh, we can say that it's always displayed on desktop, okay, there is nothing to toggle it. So we can say that on large, it's always going to be block, so it's going to be displayed correctly. But by default, it's going to be hidden if we're not large. So if I do that, by default, it's going to disappear. Now we can just use the hidden property or remove it, and by doing that, it's going to toggle, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap that into an object, use back quotes to be able to return JavaScript here. Okay, and now, well, that's pretty simple. I'm going to say that here, if is mobile menu shown, then, well, we're not going to do anything. We're not going to display the hidden, but otherwise we're going to display hidden, okay? And well, this could be simplified into if we're not showing the menu, then we want to return hidden, okay? So this, if this predicate is true, then this is going to be returned. And now, and now, well, it's not working because for now it's always false, okay? So it's always hidden. We have to toggle that when we click here. So that is pretty simple. We can go on the button here and on click, we're going to call a function that is going to do a set is mobile menu shown to the opposite of what currently is mobile menu shown. Okay, so if it's true, it's going to be false. If it was false, it's going to be true. Okay, so now if I test, yes, it's working. So when I do nothing by default, it's false. So since this is false, this is return, okay? I could write this if it helps you understand. Okay, so for now it's false, so it's hidden. And when I click, it's supposed to be true, so it's not hidden anymore. All right, cool, so it's working. All right, so that was actually a difficult part, okay? There was a lot of code just for the, the header, okay? Just for this, because the layout and the behavior is completely different between desktop and mobile, that's why we have a lot of code. But congratulations. All right, so let's continue in the next video. All right, so we are going to start working on this section, the shoe detail. So we're going to display a shoe image and then some text below that, a price, and also a button and a link. And when we're going to resize, the shoe and the text should be displayed in a row, like that, okay? So let us start. Uh, obviously, you need to notice that it's not exactly the final layout, okay? Uh, the shoe is higher, there is this background behind, etc. Uh, obviously, we have to do the, the select box here, but we're going to do that after. First, let's focus on doing that. Let's go. Okay, so the first thing we can do is start creating the shoe detail component and call it right below the nav component that we have created already. So in the components, I'm going to create a new file and it's going to be shoe detail.jsx and I'm going to create a component exactly like I did for uh, nav or app. I'm going to copy the one in app, it's closer from what we're going to have. All right, I'm going to remove everything that I have inside and I'm going to call that shoe detail. 
for now I'm not going to return anything but an empty string and in app here I'm going to call it shoe detail like that and don't forget the import at the top okay so we can go in shoe detail and start working so we're going to start with a div that is going to contain everything and we're going to have two divs okay one for uh, the description and one for the image or actually one for the image and one for the description so here we're going to have an image but for now we're going to leave it empty okay uh, and we, here we will have the description section so both of these divs will have the same size okay uh, mostly when it's going to be horizontal okay one will take half of the screen and the other one the other half so we're going to write class name flex one here and same thing here flex one okay so technically just for the test but if i write a bg red here and a bg blue here well we don't have anything because there is no content so i'm going to write hello and hi okay so for this flex one to work we have to add a class here and make everything flex okay so by default everything is horizontally displayed we don't want that by default we want everything to be in column like that but we don't want that behavior when it's in desktop so we're going to say that on desktop we want that to be flex a row and okay cool um, so this is going to be the image okay this will be the description and so it's exactly what I want here okay we'll have the image on the top and the description at the bottom but here well that's exactly the opposite thing that I want okay but since this is at the top when we go flex row this goes on the left that's the default behavior okay so we don't want that we want the flex direction to be uh, inverted uh, when we are in large screen okay we want the description to be on the left so that's pretty simple we're going to say that when it's large we want the flex row to be reverse so not just flex row like that so it's going to be row and reverse and now yes we have the image on the right pretty cool okay so now maybe we could start adding a bit of code in the description so um first let's start with the title so i'm going to write some text for now nike hair uh, max like that and here i'm going to add a class name and make it uh, big so 5xl font i'm going to make it black so it's a huge font and yep okay but we're going to make it bigger when we are for example in medium screen so i'm going to change and make it uh, 9 excel starting from medium from medium screen okay so here yep we're good okay i'm going to remove my backgrounds okay then i'm going to do the same thing but for the description so here um so i'm going actually to copy paste uh the content that i have here for now yes and since it contains uh quotes like that i'm going to surround this with curly braces and quotes this way it's considered as a string it will be evaluated as a string so no problem with the quotes inside so here i'm going to add a class name and I'm just going to make that a font medium, so I think it's a little bit uh, bigger. And we're going to change the size starting from medium. And I'm going to make it text Excel, which gives us something like that. Okay. Okay, now the price. So I'm going to write $100. I'm going to add a class name again. So I'm going to make it text. 3xl yes font extra bold and starting from medium i'm going to make it bigger 6xl like that okay so we have something like this and something like that perfect 
Now I'm going to prepare the button. So I'm going to prepare a button here with add to bag. So I'm going to set in height and a width. I'm going to make the background black. Yes, I'm going to make the text white. And I'm just going to add a hover state. This way the background is going to change a bit. Uh, BG gray 900, so it's a bit lighter. It's a very slight change. And when it's active, I'm also going to change a bit the background. Background gray um, 700, why not? Okay, and yes, okay, perfect. And also I will have a link that is view details. So view details, that is a fake link. And I'm going to add a class name again. So text large, font bold. We're going to underline it. So we can use the underline property. And so I just want the line to be a bit uh, less close to the text. So I'm going to use underline offset four, and it's just going to be a bit more distant from the text. Okay, so that's cool. We have something like that, but uh, we would like to add some spacing around all of that. So all the elements are going to be spaced exactly from the same value. I'm going to go on the parent here, and I'm just going to add a space y6. And now everything is spaced. Cool. Okay. Um, maybe we could do the same thing for these two elements. So I'm just going to add a div between my button, I mean, around my button and my link, like that. And I'm just going to add a space x uh, 10. Yes. And we have something like this, which is pretty fine. Um, now the image, well, we could maybe um, import a real image just to really understand what's going on, to really see it. So image, source, here. And with it, you have to import the image like if it's uh, uh, an object or a constant. So I'm going to do an import. You can name it exactly like you want. I'm just going to call it Nike 1 for now from and then you can go and try to grab it from your assets so i'm going to take this one so i called it min because this is a minimized version uh it's a compressed version of the original image okay um and yes you have to send this nike one okay not bad so the image is displayed cool and here well exactly what we want Okay, okay, okay. And when I resize, let's see. Oops. Yes, okay, it's getting bigger. The texts are getting bigger. Okay, so that's pretty much what we want. Cool. Okay, now maybe we could just add a little bit of space between the shoe and the text here. So maybe again, between these two elements, we can just do a space on Y maybe far. Yeah, okay. All right, so actually it's already pretty cool, okay? This could already be like a landing page that is totally legit, uh, in my opinion. Anyway, we're not going to stop there. Uh, so in the next video, we're going to work on making this shoe uh, in the background with the gradient, okay? And make it a bit higher, okay? Like that. So let's work on that in the next one. Okay, so in this video, we're going to work on the gradient here. Uh, and make sure that it works well in desktop. Uh, so we should have something like that. And uh, we're also going to update the menu here. So the color are different in the background. And finally, we're also going to load a new font. Okay, for now, we've just been using the default font, but now we're going to change it to this one. So let's do that. Okay, so let's start with a new font by loading a new font. So we're going to use font source. So you can go and type font source like that. You should end up on this website. And here you have a lot of fonts that are open source. 
And we're going to choose Nunito sans variable, this one. So I'm going to click. And you can click on install. And here you have the code that you have to copy and run to install the font. So first we're going to install it. So let's do that. And pim install then the font source. Okay. And then we have to import that at the very top of our project. So I'm going to take that and go in my index.jsx and at the very top to make sure that everything benefits from the font, uh, I'm going to add the import. And finally, I'm going to tell that everything that is going to be in my body is going to use this font. So I'm going to go in my index CSS and I'm just going to add a layer base you remember and I'm going to tell that in my body I'm going to add this font family okay you can write CSS like I told you so we're just using CSS since that is what is recommended by font source and now technically the font should be different uh, obviously I have to restart my project npm run dev and yes it's working that's the new font okay so that's how you're going to be able to add a font super easily now let's work on this gradient so let's go in shoe detail i'm going to close that okay so i'm just going to add some comments so we really see what we have so here we have the shoe image here we have the shoe uh, text details and here we have shoe um, buttons and links okay this way it's easier to find what we're looking for so for the shoe image um, so we're going to create a new div around our image to create the gradient so for a gradient to work, you have a lot of rules to use. So obviously you can find that on the official documentation, but I'm going to try to make it simple. So first you have to tell exactly what is going to be the orientation of your gradient. Okay. For example, if I go on the final product, as you can see, the gradient start from here and we can see that it's diagonal. Okay. Uh, it's not like this or like that. It's in a diagonal. So we're going to go back there and we're going to say that the BG gradient is going to start from the bottom right. So for example, like here, okay, from bottom right. Now you're going to give what is the starting color. So the starting color will start from and here you can pass a color, okay? I'm just going to specify just a color on the fly like that because we're not going to reuse this color. So I'm going to use F637CF like that. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I said that it was starting from bottom right, but it's uh, false, okay? It's going to go to the bottom right, okay? So it's going to start from the top left, the opposite, okay? So it's going to go to the bottom right, starting from this color. So here we have this color at the maximum and then it's going to decrease until it's white here. Then we're going to give uh, an intermediate color. So we're going to pass via and another color. For example, here it's going to be E3D. 876 okay so it's a kind of yellow and as you can see now we have the yellow in the middle and we're going to finally arrive at something so we're going to use the keyword two so it's from via two and two well another color so here it's going to be four cc um four c six yes a kind of green and now yes as you can see it's working perfectly 
So this is cool, your gradient is working and you can also change the position of the gradient's colors. Okay, for example here for the from, so the pink one, I can use from and then if you go at the very bottom, you can choose a percentage. So for example, if I type from 50%, it's going to take 50%. And so for example, I'm going to say five. And maybe I want the yellow color, this one to take more space so I'm going to go with via 40%. And so it's going to start earlier, okay? So you can also use that to change a bit how the gradient is uh, displaying, all right? Okay, so we're going to stop there. For now, we have this gradient that is working. It's also working on desktop, but we want to put that higher and then change the color of the links. Do not have black links into the gradient here. So let's do that in the next one. Okay, so in this video, we're going to focus on what happens on desktop, okay? So we want to put that higher, so the gradient. We want to change the color here. We want to add an hover effect on large screen. And also we want to make sure that it works fine when we resize it, okay? We want the shoe to stay uh, at the, the middle. Uh, don't worry for this little uh, change. This is because here uh, the text breaks, okay? So that's why you have a change in layout but otherwise it's fine. Okay, so let's work on that. Okay, so let's go. So uh, first thing first, I've noticed that we have not the cursor pointer on this button, so let's add it super quickly. Let's go in nav, let's go at the very bottom and on the div that surround the, the icon, let's just add a cursor pointer. Yep. Okay, all right, so now let's move this gradient up uh, only on desktop, okay? Everything that we're going to do is almost only on desktop for this video. So we want to go in the shoe detail and we want to go, yes, there. So on the shoe image. So we're going to use a negative margin for now you know how to do a margin, for example, top um, 32, but here we want to do a negative margin top. So that's super simple. Just add a minus before, and that's it. I'm going to save, and ta-da, we have moved up. So first issue, now the nav is behind. So let's change that. Let's go in the nav, and let's explicitly to the entire nav. So where is the start? Yes, here. Let's say that we want the Z index to be, so let's explicitly tell to the nav that we want it to be uh, above um, the, the, the gradient. So to do that, we could use the Z index. So to do that, we can use Z. Here we have a lot of predefined values. By default, everything is on zero. So technically, maybe we should just put, for example, I don't know, 10, like that. And as you can see, it's not working. And if you inspect the browser uh, and target the nav, so let's go to the nav here. As you can see, if I search for the Z index, as you can see, it's not working. And, oh, sorry, it's in French, but it's saying that basically Z index is not working here because this is not a positioned element. Okay, this has not been positioned using something. It's in static position for now, and that index doesn't work with static position. So it's fine. It's completely fine. We're just going to make this a relative. And now, yep, it's working. So we have several issues. We want the box here to be really at the center. We want it to start at the center here, so it's more aesthetic. So we're just going to add a margin uh, left. So again, uh, where is it? So we're going to go in the shoe detail and here, right after the margin 32, that is negative, we're going to add again on the stop only a margin left 28. Let's do that. And now, yes, it's perfectly fine. Um, okay, it's cool. But now as you can see, the button here is a bit too close from the border here. So we're going to add a bit of margin right on this button. So let's go uh, on the button. So the button is in the nav. 
and at the bottom here, OK, we're going to say that on large screen only, we want a margin right it. And yeah, that's better. Cool. OK, so now maybe let's try to make these two elements in text white and remove the background that we have uh, behind. So first, let's just make these two elements white. So let's go into nav again. So we are inside, sorry. And here in the loop, basically we're going to add a condition. So I'm just going to go right before the code here. And I'm going to say that if uh, we are on the fourth element or the fifth, it starts at zero, don't forget that. Uh, so I'm going to add parenthesis. I'm not sure if it's useful or not, but maybe. Uh, so if we are in these two elements, and basically we're just going to say that on large screen only, we don't want to update the, the mobile menu, okay? Uh, we're going to make the text white, like this. And now, yeah, perfect. Okay, cool. Uh, now, as you can see, yes, we have this background that is a bit annoying when it's white. So we're going to remove it completely and just make the text blue when we pass the mouse over. So it means that on a large screen, on a hover, we don't want the background to be visible. So we're going to make it transparent. Okay. And when I pass my mouse over, it's not there anymore. But I want it to be Blue. I want the text to be blue when I pass my mouse hover. So, so I'm going to say that on large screen, on hover, I want the text to be blue 500. Like that. And technically, ta-da! Okay. Okay, so it's pretty good. So now if I resize it, it seems like we haven't uh, broken anything, so we are good. Uh, now, one last thing, if I resize, you're going to notice that, yes, that's not super nice. The image is going to shrink like that. So we don't want that. We want the gradient and the shoe to stay centered and the gradient to take the all height. So we're just going to go back in the shoe detail. And here, we're just going to tell the gradient to take the full height that is available. So 100%. Of height so with H full. I'm going to save now. Yes, that's better. Now the gradient take the all height, but I want the shoes to be centered. So pretty simple. I'm just going to oh, what is this from doing here? Um, so I'm just going to use flex and justify center and align items center to make sure that the, the image stays centered in the gradient. So we can use our shorthand. Flex center and ta da! Now it stay at the center. Cool. Okay, so it's starting to look like something. Uh, so let's continue the next one and add the select box. See you in the next one. Okay, so in this video, we're going to build the select box here. So it's going to be a custom component that we're going to build. All right, so let's work on this component. Okay, so let's create a new component that we're going to call select.jsx. Uh, then again, we're going to copy what we have in app. Remove the content. And rename that select. So um, we are going obviously in the select to have a select. And the select come with several options, okay, like that. Um, since we are proper developers, we're not going to do that, okay? We're going to send a list of elements, and then we're going to map over it. This way, the select will be reusable. So here, we can expect to receive several options, okay? And we're even going to receive a title okay, that is going to be displayed inside. Uh, as placeholder, okay? Okay, so we're not going to do something like that. So just so you can imagine, uh, we are going to go in shoe detail and right after the dollars here at the bottom, we're going to call 
the oops the select that we've just created like that and actually we're going to call it twice because there is one for the size and one for the quantity so we can imagine that here we're going to send a quantity like that and for the other one we are going to send a size and here we're going to send an array of options here and same here so these options should be the values that we can select so what we're going to do is we're going to create a new file in source folder sorry and we're going to call it constant.js and we're going to create two constants one for the size that is going to be an array and one for the quantities like that so i'm just going to set some sizes and obviously you can add more if you want okay uh, these are european uh, sizes but uh, if you want to use american sizes feel free to change them and for the quantity as well for these ones we should have the same no matter where we are from uh, i'm going to go with uh, five quantities and then in shoe detail here i'm going to send here uh, the quantity so import it from constant okay here i have imported it from constant and i'm also going to import sizes like that and i'm going to send this okay so 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 for now nothing is displayed so here we're going to map over the options so i'm going to open curly braces to be able to write some javascript and i'm going to map over all my options so for each option i'm going to return an option tag like that and so the content here will be well the text so this is the text i mean this is the number actually so i'm going to display the option here yes and we have to use a key as well that is unique i'm again going to use the option because it should be unique um, yes as you can see we have something uh, here saying that we are not respecting the rules that says that we have to create prop types well prop types are kind of deprecated we're not going to use that so to disable this rule we're just going to go in the file eslint here we're going to go in rules there and right after the first rule we're going to add another one and we're actually going to add uh, so this one so uh, pom -pom -pom, react slash prop types okay so react slash prop types and we're going to set it to off and technically yes no more problem here okay so technically yes uh, I'm just going to move that a bit higher Okay, just, so just so you can see, we have the select here working, okay, but it's not style at all, like we want. So first thing first, uh, at first, I don't want to display directly the value here, I just want to display the name. So to do that, there is a simple trick that we can use, and it's to add another extra option, like that, that is con going to contain the title, and we're going to set a value for this option. The value is going to be nothing while for all the other option the value is going to be the option so for example for the quantity one two three four or five okay when we're going to do that as you can see by default it's the first uh, option that is displayed okay previously it was one now it's quantity okay but we don't want to be able to select quantity like that okay That's, that doesn't make sense so what we're going to do is in the select here, we're going to say that the default value is that. So to prevent the user from selecting the quantity inside, we're just going to make this option a bit specific. And we're going to say that it's disabled and hidden. Now if I refresh, so yeah. I mean, that seems weird, okay, it's not there anymore, but it's, it exists, okay? It's not visible, but it's there. So what we have to do is we just have to say to the select that 
the default value is going to be this option. So the empty one like that. I'm going to refresh and now, so by default, the default value is this one, but it won't be visible when we open the menu. Okay, so that's a trick. Okay, I had to uh, read on the internet to know how to do that, but now you can do it. And so here, as you can see, it's working as well. Okay, cool. So that's it for this simple trick. Now let's style this a little bit. So first, um, for the select, we are going to set a default size. So we're going to set 24, like that. Then we're going to remove any style that is associated to uh, the select, okay? We're going to remove the arrow, etc. okay? We want to have full control over it. So we're going to use appearance none, okay? So there is absolutely nothing visible there. Then we're going to add a border and we're going to make it gray 300. I'm going to save and okay, we have that. Then I'm going to add a bit of padding. Yes, okay, that's pretty much what we want. So now before uh, continuing and creating the icon here, maybe we can position correctly these elements. They should be on the same line here. So we can go and shoot detail and here we have the dollar and the to select. So we can wrap that into a div and position everything on a row. So I'm going to do class name. I'm going to make it flex. And as soon as I do that, they are on a row. And I'm going to add a bit of spacing horizontal between these elements like that. Cool. Okay. And now, so I'm going to go back in my select and I'm just going to add here an icon. So I'm going to choose the I O I O S arrow down. Okay. And you can import it from react icons slash I O like that. So as you can see, it's not positioned correctly. So we're just going to um, make that absolute. And now that is absolute, we want to make sure that it's absolute, but based on this element, relatively to this element. So what we're going to do is we're going to make the parent relative. By doing that now, the positioning absolute is going to be done relatively to this element. So uh, now technically, if I go uh, right zero, it's going to go at the right zero of this element, okay? Um, but as you can see by default, it's outside of the select box. So we're going to readjust the origin, okay? So let's readjust the origin using inset y and then zero. Then it's going to be really go to the zero of the parent element, okay? That's why we are here now. Now, we can say, okay, I want to go to the right zero since the Y is all good. And now, well, I'm just going to center that. So I'm just going to do a flex center. All right. And now just a bit of padding right. And we're good. The select is done. This was a bit tricky because uh, you have to remember that when you set an element in absolute, uh, if you want to move it relatively to the parent, you have to make the parent relative. And then if you have to reset the origin, you can use inset, okay? And you can also use inset x. Okay, so I think we're good for the select for now. So let's see if on desktop it's all right. So it's all right, but as you can see, the background is not the same color, uh, which is actually quite strange. Uh, oh, because this is not the same browser. This is Mozilla and this is Chrome, so they, don't have the same default style. So to make sure that everything is okay everywhere, we're just going to explicitly tell that the background has to be white. This way, it looks the same way on both browser. Okay, we're good. Uh, so let's continue in the next one. Okay, so in this video, I'm going to show you how to use the Tailwind animations and how to create your own. So we're going to add a small animation for the shoe here, like it's floating. We're also going to add an animation when the application is loaded, okay? And as you can see, when I'm 
loading the application, there is a small fade in, and so it loads smoothly, it appears smoothly with a small opacity change. And we are also going to add an animation on the buttons so it feels like they are pressed. Okay, we're going to change the scale with a small transition, and we're going to do that for this button as well. All right? Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to show you that you can use the built-in animations provided by Tailwind. They are not a lot, but sometimes they are useful. So I'm going to go, for example, I don't know, uh, in shoe detail, and we're going to go on the div that wrap the image, okay, the shoe image. So if you want to use an animation that is built-in, you can use animate and then you will have some propositions. So for example, animate spin, so it's going to make everything spin infinitely. Um, so yeah, as you can see, that's pretty aggressive, but it works, okay? And you have others like that. You have spin, you have ping, you have pulse, which is better, and we have bounce. Okay, so by default, they run infinitely and you can pass your mouse over and you're going to see what's going to happen. Okay, there is a keyframe in CSS that has been created and from zero to 100%, we're going to translate to minus 25%. And as you can see here, we're using the cubic Bezier function and basically this gives an effect of acceleration. All right, um, okay, so, we're going to remove that and we're going to first create our own animation. So I'm going to show you how to create your own animations. So we're going to go in Tailwind config. And in Tailwind config, basically you'll be able to create an animation and then create another piece of configuration to tell exactly how you want to use this animation. For example, let's say we want to create a small animation that gives um, the feeling that the, the, the gradient here is wiggling, okay? It's doing something like that, okay? So we're going to add a keyframes here, and that's where we're going to really define what's inside the animation, what the animation does, step by step. So here we're going to say that as 0% of the animation, so when it starts, we're going to transform then we're going to give the CSS transformation. So we're going to do a rotation, for example, so a rotate of minus three degree. Okay, like that. And then we could say, for example, that at 100%, so at the end of the animation, the tr transformation should be rotate three degree. So the animation has been created. Once you have created your keyframe, okay, you have actually to give it a name. So I'm going to call that wiggle, like that, okay? Now outside of my keyframes, I can have an animation section. And here you can basically tell that you want to create an animation that's also called wiggle, okay? So you can set any name here. This is the name that you're going to call into your HTML. And here you can say exactly which keyframe you want to call. I want to call wiggle. And I want the wiggle animation to take one second to move from zero to 100%. So I'm going to say, say one second. And then, well, you can say that you want that to run infinitely, like this. Now, if you want to call it, you just look at the name that you have set in the animation section, so it's wiggle. I'm, do, I'm going to go in my uh, div here and I'm going to call animate. And as you can see now, wiggle exists. And I'm going to save. And as you can see, it seems that it's working, but that's not exactly what I want, okay? I want a smooth effect like it's going from left to right. But here we're saying that at 0%, we should be there and at 100%, we should be the other side. So when the animation is finished, we go back to the first step. So we go back instantly to minus three degree, okay? And 
Now it's done infinitely, but I could have removed it. And now it's just going to happen once. Okay, if I refresh, it happens once, and then it's resetting uh, its position. Okay. So I'm going to set it uh, infinite, but now I'm going to say that basically we're going to go from minus three degree, then three degree, then go back to minus three degree. So to do that, we're going to say that here at 50%, we would be at three degree, and here at 100%, we'll go back to minus three degree, like that. Now look, that's better. Okay, we don't have the blink and the position that reset. Okay, cool. Uh, but I would like to have something smoother. Okay, for now it's exactly the same speed all the time. We can use is in out to tell that we want the speed to be different. Okay, so it basically means that when the the animation start and when the animation end, we're going to ease the movement. Otherwise, it's going to be faster. So it's going to be slow at the beginning, slow at the end, but faster in the middle. I'm going to save, and now, well, that's more realistic, okay? Like a pendulum or something like that. Okay, cool. Um, so that's nice, but I don't really want a wiggle animation for my shoe, okay? I would like just the shoe to move, and I would like it to kind of float. So for now, I'm just going to remove the wiggle animation. You can keep it in your tailwind if you want to reuse it later. And I'm going to create a float animation. And exactly in the same ID, we're not going to change the rotation, okay? We're not going to do something like that, but we're going to do something like that. Just the vertical uh, version of wiggle, if I may say. So basically, I'm going to say that at zero and 100%, I'm going to transform, and I'm going not to rotate, but translate, and translate on the y-axis. So at the beginning and at the end, I want to come back to the original position. And at the middle of the animation, I want to translate for a value, uh, let's say, I don't know, minus 10. We're just going to go a little bit lower and then go back to the original position. Like that, and it's px. Okay, now I'm going to tell exactly how I want to use the animation. So I'm going to call it float, and I'm going to call the float keyframe. It's going to take, I don't know, four seconds. I'm going to use the ease in out to have a cool, smooth speed. And I'm going to tell that it's going to be infinite. And now let's go on the shoe, and here I can call my animate float. So cool. Um, so if I do that, as you can see, it's uh, the all gradient and the shoe that moves. I don't want that. I just want the shoe to move. So I'm going to remove that, add a class name to my image, and do it here. And now, yes, I just have the shoe. Okay. And look at that. I like it. It's really simple, but it adds a little bit of something in the application. Okay, um, cool, so now we've created our own animation. Maybe we could add an animation for when the application is loading for the first time. So basically we just want the opacity to go from invisible to completely visible in like a few seconds, one second, for example. So again, it's going to be pretty simple. We're going to create a new animation that is going to be fade in. Here, we're going to say that at 0%, when the application starts, it's not visible at all. So we're not going to use transform because it's not about the position, it's just about the opacity, okay? If you want to know all the properties that you can use, you have to read the documentation. And so at first, we're going to be at zero, okay? So it's completely invisible. Oh, here I have to set percent. And well, that's pretty simple here. When we reach 100%, when the animation is finished, we want everything to be completely visible. Now here, we can create a fade in. We're going to call fade in, in like, I don't know, one second. Again, we're going to try to make it smooth. So I'm going to use the ease in out 
and it's not going to be infinite okay once it's visible it's visible okay now we have to call that for the entire application so i'm going to go in app and since this is the higher uh, parent i'm going to call it here so animate fade in and tada look pretty cool so just by adding this little animate fade in on your pages it gives a feeling of smoothness um, okay cool now one last animation maybe for the button so this one is going to be a little bit different because that's not really an animation well it is but you want to have some control over it so for the button is going to be slightly different because it's not really a regular animation okay you're not triggering a simple animation when you're clicking okay you want for example when you click for the scale to stay smaller and when you release you want it to go back to its to its original size so we cannot really use a classic animation like we did but we can use a set of property provided by Tailwind to do that let's say I go in my shoe detail I'm going to go back in my button here and here basically I want the scale to be like 75 when the button is active meaning when it's clicked so if I do that so it's here okay if I do that when I'm going to click so it's working I have the control because when I release the active property is removed but there is no transition here okay so if I want to transition that's pretty simple you just add the key word transition by doing that you're telling that if there is an animation Tailwind is going to try to find the, the logical transition to go to this point, okay, to this value progressively. So now, if I click, yes, the transition is done. And you just created an animation for your button. And since I'm lazy and I don't want to, anytime I have a button, add this like that, I'm going to take the entire rule here. And I'm going to create a utility from that. So I'm going to go in my index.css. Here I'm going to create a new utility. Then I'm going to call, for example, button press anim, like that. And I'm just going to do this. Now I can just call that on all my buttons. So I'm going to go there. And now I'm just going to add a button press anim. So, yep, it's working. And I could even add it on this button here. So I'm going to go in my nav. And here, I'm just going to do the same thing. Button press anim. And now, yep, it's working as well. Okay, so that's pretty much what you have to know about animations okay you can create your own you can create the default one provided by tailwind and if you want to really have control over the animation you better use the tailwind states like active focus or something like that and then provide the animation directly uh, using tailwind okay so yeah i hope it's clear and see you in the next one okay so in this video we're going to start building the card that is going to be at the bottom of the application so we're just going to create this component, okay? When we're going to pass the mouse over, it's going to grow a little bit. And so it can receive a title, a subtitle for the link, and an image, but also uh, a class, okay? We can send a background color that is different. We're going to make it able to receive a class. This way we can customize it, okay? And so it's going to look like something like that on desktop, and it should be able to resize correctly, okay? As you can see, the shoe um, go over the edges, but that's on purpose. All right, so let's work on that. Okay, so since we are going to focus only on the, um, on the card, what I suggest is we go in app, and here we're just going to comment the nav and the shoe detail for now, okay? And I'm going to save. This way we can start from scratch and work only on the card. Then we're going to go in component and create a new card.jsx. 
here we're going to create a component. I'm going to call it card like that. Um, and now that it's exported, I'm just going to go in my app and just call it right there. And don't forget to import it. So we need data for our cards. Okay, we're going to have several cards and we want to have an array of data. This way we can instantiate several cards. So we're going to go in constant and we're going to create an array of shoes. Okay, where a shoe is made of several things. One shoe is going to be made out of a title. There will be a description because we're not going to only uh, use this data for the card. Okay, we're going to also use them for the detail. Okay, and we're going to when we are going to click on a card, it's going to change the element here. Okay, so this is going to basically be all the data of our application. So we'll have a description for the shoe. Okay, so just so you can see, but this will be the title, this will be uh, the description. Then we're going to have a unique identifier for the, the card. So we're going to do that after. We will need a source image. So we'll have source. And finally, we'll have a price here. Well, not finally, because we will also have a different color for uh, each card, okay? So we're going to be able to send a complete class name like that. This way we'll have full power over the card to design it. So this is one shoe, okay? And we're going to have several shoes like that. So I'm going to attach to this video the complete constant.js file. This way you can copy it if you want. And I'm going to fill the shoes array with fake data. So once you will have copy and paste the content, you should have something like that. At the top, you will have four imports for all the images. Okay. Uh, so you will still have your sizes and quantity, no change here. And in the shoe list, where well, you will have a different ID for each element, you have like, yeah, four elements. For each one, a different image. For each one, a different class name that is just a different background color. Okay, here, and I'm using uh, a custom color on the fly. Then different title, a different description, and a different price. Okay, and we're going to use this data. Now, we can imagine that a card is going to receive one element, so one item, and we're going to take it from the shoe list and we're going just for the test, okay? Just for the test, we're going to send the first element, okay? So don't forget to import it. Now we can work on the card. So here we expect to receive an item. So here we're going to have a parent div. And in this div, we'll have two sections the section for the text and an image. So I'm going to write um, shop now with a plus. That will be the link. Uh, and above that, we'll have the title. So I'm going to write item.title like that. And actually, we're going to put them each in a div. So uh, in the text section, we have two texts. Okay, We have the title and we have the link. So the link can be art coded. Oops. The link can be art coded and it's going to say shop now plus. And here we're going to display the title. In the image, we're going to use the source and we're going to use the item, item dot source like that. Okay, so we have something like that when I save. Great, great, great. So um, first of all, in the parent div here, we're going to use the item that class name, okay, to be able to have a background color. So I'm going to use back quotes here and just do item dot class name. And 
I already have my background now. Then, 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 then. Well, when I pass my mouse over, I want the car to grow. So already I'm going to do a transition. And when I'm going to hover, I want the scale uh, to change a bit. So by default, it's 100. So I'm just going to make it 105. And yep, not bad. Okay. Uh, also, I want my mouse to display a cursor. So I'm just going to do cursor pointer. And now I have the little hand. Cool. Okay, now on the image, uh, I have to define a size, otherwise it's going to be super huge. It's going to try to take the whole space if it can. And as you can see, that's what we have on desktop. It's a bit too big. So we're going to change the size and set it to 40 and a width to 56. And yes, that's better. Then maybe we can set a maximum width for the card. So the cool thing is that you have something to do that with Tailwind, max W, and then you have several possibilities. So I'm just going to do max W Excel maybe. And this way, yes, that's the maximum we can have. Okay. Then I'm going to add a little bit of padding, but just for the text. So I'm going to do P8, like that. Okay, then for the title, for the title, I'm just going to make the text a bit bigger, like that, yes. And I'm going to make it bold. Yes, perfect. Then uh, for the link. So the link, I want it to be underline. And like I did previously, I don't know if you remember, but we can add a little bit of offset. This way the line is a bit more distant from the text. Okay, and I'm going to make the font semi-bold like that. Okay, and I'm going to add a little bit of spacing from the text above. So I'm going to use a margin top 10. Okay. Now I want my shoe to be on the right, but I also want it to be able to get uh, over the edges of the card, meaning that it has to be absolute. So I'm going to make this shoe absolute, like that. And now we want it to be placed here, so we're going to reset the origin correctly using top zero, yes, or maybe top five, okay. And well, we're going to put it at 40% um, of the left. But as you can see now, there is a problem. When I pass my mouse over, the shoe moves weirdly, okay. Um, and this is because I made a mistake. I made a mistake because I told you previously that when you do uh, an animation like a scale change or something like that, you can use transition, which is totally true. But the documentation say that you also have to use transform. Otherwise, if you have several elements that are animated, for example, the image and the card and the text, everything at once, you could have weird behaviors if you don't add transform. So I'm going to add it. And as you can see by default now, the shoe is correctly positioned and everything is moving all together. So actually, when I set top zero here, it was correctly positioned, but the missing transform made it weirdly positioned. So, 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 so maybe, yes, we can set, still set five because I want it to go over the edges. And well, that's not bad. We have something like that. And yeah, it seems like it's pretty fine. Okay. So that's fine. Now in the next video, we're going to try to create a column uh, of um, card if it's on mobile or a grid of card if it's on desktop. So let's work on that. Okay, so in this video, we're going to work on the grid here. And when we're going to resize it, technically it should adapt, okay? So as you can see here, we have three element and one. Here we have two and here only one per row, all right? So let's work on that. Okay, so the first thing we can do is maybe uh, uncomment everything here in app, uh, remove the card here and create a new component. So I'm going to remove the card as well. 
and create a new component that is going to be a new arrival section dot jsx and i'm going to create a component new arrival section like that um, so technically this new arrival section is going to receive the entire array of data okay because it has to be able to display the entire list of uh, shoes so here we're going to suppose that we're going to receive an array of items meaning that here in app here we can call the new arrival section below the shoe detail and we're going to send it the items being the shoe list like that so uh now oh well before starting that uh, i just noticed that on the select here when you click directly on the icon as you can see nothing happens so that's another topic but we can fix that super quickly okay uh this is because by default we could tell that the icon is kind of absorbing the click so to prevent that we can go super quickly in shoe detail um, on the select so where is it it's there so let's go into select sorry and here around the icon we're going to write pointer pointer events none this way the click will not be absorbed okay and now technically even if you click here yep it's working cool uh, so go back to the new arrival section and now let's work on that so i'm going to create a parent div here and then here we're going to have first the title and here the list so for the title I'm going to write new arrivals like that. Okay, so it's here a new arrival. So new arrival, we want that to be um, text for Excel and a font extra bold. Okay, and yes, new arrivals like that. Okay, so it should be actually new arrivals here, and I'm just going to rename the component new arrivals. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm going to update the import and make sure that in app uh, it's been correctly renamed. Arrivals. And here I'm going to save. Okay. Um, so now we want that to be centered. So I'm going to ask the parent to flex center everything. And I'm going to add a margin top 20. Uh, but what's going on? New arrivals. Okay, I didn't save correctly. Okay, so everything is centered. There is a bit of margin top. Perfect. Now I would like to add a background image behind my text just for the style. Okay. Um, so if you remember, I have something called lines. That is this image here. And I want that to be behind the text. So uh, I'm just going to add a background here and instead of passing a color you can actually pass some kind of CSS a value and I'm going to use URL like this I'm going to use simple codes and so be careful the URL starts from the source folder okay so from the source we want to go in assets directly and then grab the lines.png and yes as you can see it's displayed but it's not centered so I'm going to use background center and well that's better okay now we can work on the grid so in this div here I'm going to loop over my items using map so for each items I'm actually on one item and for this item I want to return don't need parenthesis a card component so i'm going to do something like that yes i have to put that in parenthesis sorry and yeah we are good so card card why is it not possible to import it directly i don't know 
So I'm going to import it from card. Yes. So card, um, first, for each element of an array in a loop, in a map, sorry, you have to pass a key. So we could use the item.id, which is supposed to be unique. Now, now we can sell the all item here. So I'm going to pass the all item. I'm going to save. So what do we have? Yes, there is something happening. Okay. And here, yeah, definitely something happening. So, um, well, I made a mistake. I should have had centered everything. Okay, I'm going to remove this. Yes, and I'm just going to center this div here. So I'm just going to create another div for the text, and I'm only going to center the text like that. Okay, and on this div here, I'm just going to add a bit of margin top as well. Okay, so we have our elements. Now, now, well, that's what we have here, okay? Uh, and remember, this is because we have set a max XL, otherwise it would take the full width, okay? So, um, we're going to use the grid system. Basically, we're going to say that by default, we want uh, one column, so grid calls one. So for now, that's exactly what we have. But we are going to add a bit of spacing and to add spacing in a grid, we're using gap. So gap, um, well, gap y26. And it's not working, why is that? Because 26 doesn't exist, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, only 24. Okay, that's better. And we have the same result on this top. Now, we don't want the same behavior for the grid. We want one column when it's in mobile, maybe two when it's in medium, and why not three when it's um, bigger? So, we could do something like that. We could say that on medium or above, we're going to have a grid calls two. And on Excel or above, we will have a grid called three, like that. And so let's see. Yes, seems like we have three elements. Here we have two and here we have one. So that's perfect. Only issue is that we don't have any spacing, any horizontal spacing. So that's pretty simple, exactly like with this rule, we can do a gap x and why not six? And now, yep, that's better, cool. So uh, let's say you're not satisfied with the size of uh, the, each element in your grid, you can actually change them. For example, let's say on Excel, we want um, the element to be smaller for some reason. Well, that's totally possible. So we can just replace this by a more specific rule. And we can do grid x calls. And then here, we're not only going to specify how much columns we have, but also how many space they should take. So to do that, you have to use the repeat rule here. And you're going to say that you want three columns and for example, you could say, I want each column to take 100% of the space. If you do that, well, this one is going to take 100% of what remains. Uh, but we don't want that, obviously. So for example, if we set maybe 25%, well, it's going to be smaller, as you can see. Now, um, that's nice, okay. But uh, we want that maybe to be spaced correctly, okay? We don't want that to be on the left. So we could maybe use a justify between because you can use that even if you are on a display grid, okay? Not only flex. So here, if I do a justify between, it's going to add space, an, uh, an equal space between all the elements. I'm going to save. And now they all have the same space between them. And so they are smaller and still centered. Okay, and if I go like that, that's perfect.
Okay? So that's a little trick that you can use to really uh, change and be really accurate with your column and column sizes. Okay, so now the result is pretty satisfying in my opinion. Um, now maybe we could work on the sidebar when we click on the shopping button. So let's work on that in the next one. Okay, so in this video, we're going to work on the animated sidebar. So when I click on the shopping button menu, we should have a sidebar that is going to appear with a slide with a slight translation, sorry. And when uh, it's going to be open, as you can see, the rest of the app will be covered with a dark overlay, okay? And obviously, when we're going to click on the X here, technically, the overlay should be removed and the sidebar should close in the opposite direction, all right? Uh, and there is one difference on mobile, okay? It's just the size of the sidebar. Here, it just take a part of the screen, but here on mobile, when I click on the button, it takes the whole screen. All right, so that's the only difference between mobile and desktop. All right, so let's work on that. All right, so we could create a new component that is going to be sidebar. So sidebar.jsx, and we're going to create an empty component like that. So uh, first thing first, we can call this component into app. So here, right after the new arrivals section, I'm going to call my sidebar. And don't forget to import it. So what do we have here? So I'm just going to create an empty div for now. So in this sidebar, we will have a button, the close button here, that will just be an X like that. And then, uh, so it's going to, this is going to be positioned absolutely, okay, on the top right of the sidebar. Uh, but for the rest, well, we want to be able to send what we want to the sidebar. This way, it, it, we can reuse it, okay? So here, we're going to say that we expect to receive a children, okay? A children can be any kind of JSX, okay? Any kind of uh, component or elements. And we will also have a component, I mean, an element for the overlay. So first of all, we have to display that. So I'm going to give the full width and the full height by default, oops, for the, for the sidebar. I'm going to set a background white and I'm going to make it fixed. And I'm going to make it start from top zero. Okay, so what is going on here? Well, now we have a huge rectangle that take 100% on 100% on the screen. Okay. Uh, so first, maybe we could change the z-index to make sure it's above everything. Nothing should be above the sidebar. So I'm just going to set a z-index 50 to make sure that it's above everything. So it's at the top zero, but I'm also going to make it start from the right uh, well, from the left, zero, like that, okay? So it's really starting there, okay? Just to show you, but if I make it red, okay, it takes everything. Um, okay, so the button, well, the button is not positioned correctly. We want it to be right there, okay? Uh, so I'm going to position absolutely, because this way we can have a title that is above if we want, or under, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to position it absolutely. So this is going to be absolute. And I'm going to put it at four from the right and four from the top, like that. And I'm just going to add a bit of padding. So P2, um, yes, this way it has a bigger range to click on it. Um, and I'm going to make it text black, okay, and font bold, yes. So now we have to create an animation and run it depending on if the sidebar is open or if it's closed. So what we're going to do is actually we're going to 
make it. So what we're going to do is that we're going to create an animation that is going to tell that when it's closed, it's going to move to the edge until it's out of screen. And when uh, it's open, it's going to go back to its original position. So we're just going to make it slide, actually. It's a trick. So how to do that? Well, what we're going to do is we are going to receive a props that is going to tell us if the sidebar is open. Then I'm going to replace that with back quotes to be able to write some JavaScript inside here. And at the end, I'm just going to look. Is it open? And then, well, we're going to do something, otherwise do something else. If it's open, like now, we're going to tell Tailwind to make a translation to the origin of where it was at the beginning. So I'm going to tell translate x0. Otherwise, we want to do 100% of translation on the other side. So to do that, I'm going to do translate x full, like that. So it's a kind of translation on x of 100%. So for now, we can suppose that open is false, okay, because it's undefined. So for now, the translation is starting from the other side of the screen, okay, it's after my mouse here. And if I, for example, write true, it's going to be like that. But for now, we don't see the animation running. And this is because we need the transition and the transform. Now look at that. If I write true, yep, as you can see, you can see it come like that. And if I write false, oh, it's moving to the other side. So now the transition is a bit fast. So maybe we could change the duration of the transition by typing duration and choosing a um, duration in millisecond. Okay, so it's going to take 300 milliseconds from going to over the edge to the original position. So I'm going to write duration 300 like that. And now look at this. If I go true, yep, that's slower. Okay, better. All right, so now we have to use this is open and make it change. So we're going to go in app and this is pure React, okay? Um, so if you're not really experienced with React, this may be a little bit weird to you. So I'm going to create a state that is going to be is sidebar open and by default is going to be false. I'm going to use a use state from React. Now we want this button to be able to run this function and send it true, okay? Call set is sidebar open true to make the is sidebar open change. So I'm going to take this function and send it to the nav, okay? And I'm going to call it on click shopping button. Here, I'm just going to send a function, okay? I'm going to send a function to execute that is going to do a set is sidebar open to true. Okay, so I'm sending this function to on click shopping button props, meaning that inside nav, I now have access to an on click shopping button props, that is the function. And I'm just going to tell here my card button to on click run the on click shopping button like that. So technically when I'm going to click, it's going to call this function, set is sidebar open to true. So the is sidebar open is going to become true. And I'm going to send this is sidebar open to my sidebar, true is open, like that. It's going to become true. And so here it's going to become true and return this. Okay, so if I click, Yes, it's working. Now we have to handle the close here. So that's pretty much the same thing. Here, now, this is the X that is going to close uh, the, the sidebar. So I have to send the set is sidebar open to my sidebar. So I'm going to call on click 
close like that and I'm going to send a function that is going to do a set each sidebar open to false this time. So it's called onClickClose. So in sidebar here, technically I now have access to onClickClose. That is basically the function that is going to set the state to false. Okay, so I'm going to take that and on click on the X button here, I'm going to call on click close. That should run this. And so it's going to change the value if sidebar open to false. And the sidebar is using this value to decide if it should or not run one animation or the other. So now if I click here, yes, it's working. When I click there, it's opening and when I click there, it's closing. So it's working fine. Cool, nice. Now the sidebar can receive a children. You remember here, I can now send anything. Okay, I can send, I can send hi like that. And technically here, that's the children. So it's displayed here. So technically when I'm going to click, I should see my hi here. So I'm just going to add a little bit of padding um, on my sidebar, so I'm going to set a padding maybe five like that. Yes, this way it's displayed like this. So now it's working on mobile, but what about desktop? So if I look on desktop, well, it's taking the full width, okay? And that's not exactly what we want, but that should be easy. We know how to do that. For now, the width is always full, 100%. But we could say that on, for example, medium screen, we want the width to be like 50%. And why not on large, say that uh, the width should be 35%, like this. Uh, and I'm just going to add a little bit of shadow as well, uh, a shadow LG, a pretty big shadow. And now let's see, Ouch! something's wrong here. I'm going to refresh. Yep, something is wrong, definitely wrong. Okay, so we have an issue here. So what did I do wrong? Technically, by default, it should be completely out of range. So it means that translate X full is not working as expected. Oh, and this is because I made a mistake. I said fixed left zero, but technically it should be right zero. Okay, now technically if I close, yes, it's still working. And here, what's going on? If I click, yes, that's better. Okay, and if I resize it, yes, it's taking half of the screen when we are in medium and everything when we are on mobile. Um, so sorry, since I made a mistake here, I just want to make it really clear what's going on here, okay? By default, the position of the sidebar that uh, takes um, the full height and the full width, okay, is right zero, top zero, meaning it's completely here and out of the screen, okay? So you can imagine that right next to the, the page here, we have an entire sidebar that is here, okay? Then, um, by default, okay, it's translated at 100%, so nothing happens. But when we're going to click on open, this is going to be returned instead of that, and we're going to move to X0, okay? The X0 is here, so the entire sidebar is going to move until it's covering the entire screen. Okay, and again, when we're going to click again, then the entire sidebar here is going to move at 100% from where it is. So zero, 100% is all of that. So it's going to be right here, okay? All right, so I hope it's uh, clearer because sorry, I made a mistake at uh, first. Okay, now one last thing, we don't have the overlay here, okay, we want everything not to be clickable when we have the sidebar open. So that's pretty simple. Here we have prepared the overlay.
So the overlay is just basically a huge square that takes the entire screen and that is almost above everything. Above everything except the sidebar. So I'm going to use a class, a class name, make it fixed, so I cannot scroll uh, over it, etc. Then I'm going to make it start at left zero, top zero. I'm going to make it Z20, so it's below the sidebar, but above everything. And make it take the full height, the full width. I'm going to make a BG black and add a bit of opacity so it's not completely black, like that. And so let's see. Ouch, not good, it's happening in the sidebar. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, 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 it, this is because it's inside the sidebar. So maybe we have to create another div here and put it outside of the sidebar. So, yep, seems like it's what we want, but not all the time, okay? When we, it's closed, we want it to be removed. Uh, so we have to do that only if the sidebar is open. Well, with React, it's pretty simple. We can just uh, wrap all of that with curly braces and then tell that if it's open, then you want to return this piece of code. Otherwise, you're not returning anything. So let's see. Now, if I click, yes, perfect. We have a working sidebar that is responsive. Amazing. All right, so now in the next video, we're going to try to create some elements and put them into the sidebar. So let's do that in the next one. All right, so in this video, we're going to work on the cart items. So we are going to prepare some fake cart items some fake data that we're going to send to the cart just to see if we can really display some cart items. So on mobile, it should look like this. All the elements are in a list. And when I pass my mouse over, there is a background like that. And that's it for now. And it should be responsive. So if I resize it, it should still work properly and it should still be displayed properly. Okay. So for now, we're not going to make it dynamic. We will do that at the end of the project. Let's go. Okay, so we could start by creating a new component that is going to be cart item.jsx and it's going to be a React component cart item like that. This cart item will probably receive an item. Um, and so just for the test, we're going to go in app and instead of high here, first we're going to display a title maybe. So here I'm going to display cart and I'm just going to add a class name, um, make it a text Excel, for example, to Excel and uh, a font bold like this. So I'm going to open that. And okay, then I'm going to add a bit of margin bottom, maybe 10. And here I'm going to display a cart item. Actually, I'm going to display several cart items just for fun. Then, uh, well, the item, well, we're just going to send a random item of the shoes list. So I'm going to send here the shoe list item, for example, zero. And I'm going to repeat that but with other elements, just to see how it looks like. So here two and here three, for example. Okay, so what do we have here? I'm just going to create a div and let's go. So we will have an image for the product. We will have somewhere the item.title and we will also have the item dot description and even the item dot price. Okay, I'm just going to set the source already. So it should be item dot source. And we have 
everything. But as you can see, we cannot scroll in the sidebar, which is not cool. So let's move into the sidebar and just add on the uh, first div maybe. Uh, I think it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm just going to put it here and it's going to be overflow overflow y auto. And technically now, yes, we can scroll into the sidebar, which is perfect. Um, okay, so first the image is a bit too big, so I'm just going to give it a maximum height. Yes, okay. Um, on the parent div, I'm going to set an hover and a background. Um, so I'm just going to set a kind of green. Um, if you want, you can add that into your theme if you want to reuse this color, but I don't think we are going to reuse it in the project. So I'm just writing it like that. So DAFFA2. And technically, already we have something like that. Cool. I'm just going to add a bit of padding. Okay. Then I would like to have my mouse uh, with the cursor. So I'm going to add cursor pointer. Yes, better. Now I'm going to add a slight background by default here, okay, instead of white. So um, maybe I can do it here, BG gray 100. Oh, that's, a, oh yeah, that's that's all right. That's fine. Or maybe just, just a slight, slight background. So it's barely visible. Now all the elements should be spaced a little bit, but this will not be done inside this component. It will be done outside. Um, now, this should not be displayed in column, but horizontally. So I'm going to make that flex, which is better. Now for the title, I'm going to set a font bold. Um, for the description, I'm going to make the text small and the text gray 400 like that. Yes, for the price, I'm going to add a dollar symbol. I'm going to add a class name and make it font bold. Okay, now we don't want the title and the description to be on the same line. I want the title and then below that the description. So I'm just going to wrap the title and the description into a single div. And yes, that's better. Okay, that's pretty much what we want, actually. Um, maybe we could add a little bit of spacing between the title and description. So on the parent here, I'm going to add a space Y2. Yeah, not bad. Uh, now maybe the image is a bit too close uh, to the text and same for the 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 price so maybe um i can add a bit of space x space x sorry um between everything okay that's better all right so what do we have if i resize yep seems like it's fine okay so uh, that is pretty much what we want for now now in the next video we're going to add you know the inputs we're going to display what is the current quantity and what is the current size for this element this way if later we add several time this item uh, and change the quantity we should see it in the little inputs okay so just to show you it should look like this as you can see we should have a quantity and a size like that uh, and we should be able to modify them so it's basically the same component that we have here but a smaller one and also we should also display a little trash icon here to be able to later delete this item from the cart. All right, so let's do that in the next video. All right, so in this video, we're going to see how to create this section in the cart item by reusing the select and adding an icon here. For now, the select is still big, but we will fix that after. Let's go. 
All right, so let's go back to the cart item. Now let's create a new old section below the description and actually all of that. So we're going to create a new div to be able to split everything. Um, I'm just going to add some comments quickly. So I'm just going to write this as image just so we can really see what's going on. Here we'll have title and description here price okay so now let's create a new div and so inside we will have um, well a first block for the input and the label another label and another input and finally the trash icon uh, so actually the trash icon could just be a button with an icon that would be CI, um, no, CI trash like that. It will have a size of 25 and a class name text black because an icon is actually behaving like a text. Uh, we're going to import that. So it comes from CI trash from react icon slash CI. Okay, so in this div, we will have a text and a select. So actually this can just be a select directly like that. So let's import or tit, why it's not working, I don't know. So let's import select from components select. Uh, and we're going to have actually the same thing right there. Um, dum -dum -dum, this should be in a div. So we'll have, yes, this select, this select, this button, and everything should be on a row. So flex, now we have to send some data to the select, okay? So technically this select is just a size select and the other one is just a quantity select, okay, for now. So we're just going to set options and here we're going to set uh, sizes, I think. Oh, the import's not working today, don't know why. Import sizes and quantity from constant it's not quantity yes it is okay and we're going to send options quantity like that uh, okay it's starting to look like something let's add a label so here it's going to be quantity oh actually size and quantity Yes, so this could be font bold and same for the other one. Okay, now we could add a justify between so the elements are not uh, too close from each other. Yes, um, now first issue, as you can see now it's not in the same box, but we want this to be part of the box. So we have to do a slight change actually. We have to move a lot of information that are here in this div. So for example, um, so the cursor is going to be on the parent, the background, the hover, yes, all of that should be on the parent. Now, yes, that's better. Okay. Okay, okay, uh, so I don't want these two elements to be too far from each other. So maybe I could put them in a div together, like that. Uh, yes, and use a class name again, uh, and make that flex, yes. And just add a bit of space X, like that. Okay, okay, uh, but I want this to be below here so I'm just going to add 
a padding left 32. Yes, cool. Well, 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 that's not bad. Um, yes, here I need a title. So I'm going to write 20 uh, sizes, sorry. Size. And quantity like this okay well actually this shouldn't be uh, this it should be the value already because technically if the element is in the cart it already has a size and a quantity so for now let's just uh, set that to empty we will fill that later well actually we're not far from having finished this section maybe we could just add a bit of spacing between this line and all the content here so maybe here we could add a bit of space y2 yes okay okay so to me that's pretty much fine and now technically if we uh, resize yeah everything seems fine yep everything seems cool okay um well we can continue the next one to see how to resize that and also how to display that in a real list that with a real loop and add some spacing between each elements so let's do that in the next one okay so for now um, the inputs here are too big so we want to make them generic and make them able to receive a class name this way we can customize them when we use them so that's what we're going to do and i'm going to show you something so we're going to go in component and we're going to go in select. So if we go there for now, we have defined a width of 24 and added a bit of padding. Okay. Um, so for now it's like that. And for example, if I set the padding a bit lower, for example, just one, that's pretty much what we want. Okay. And maybe we can again uh, reduce a bit the width. So maybe we could just set a width to 16 like that uh, and remove this one obviously if i do that it's going to look like this everywhere and we don't want that so what we're going to do is we're going to let the style as it was previously and we're just going to add the possibility to send a class name so here i'm going to make that an object i'm going to use back quotes like that and now here we're going to assume that we are going to receive a class name from the parent and here we're going to call this class name like that so technically the class name that we're going to send is going to be at the end of the style so it should override what we have previously okay if i send w16 it will be there so it will be after this one so it should be all right. So let's try that. Let's go in the cart item. And here now, technically in the select, we can send a class name. And I'm just going to send W16 and padding one. Okay. And I'm going to do the same thing for the other select. Like that. So now, yes, it's working here and no changes here. Perfect, exactly what we want. But there is a slight problem with this approach. Let me explain. Uh, for now, what we're doing is working, okay? We're just overriding an existing property. We know that there is already some width and some padding inside the select and we're just overriding it. But in CSS, there are some properties that are stronger than other. And some properties take precedence over other. Let me give you an example. Let's say here I have a padding um, four. Just for the test, I'm going to make it super huge, okay? Like 44, like that. So it's completely breaking the, <laughs> the UI, but it's fine. As you can see, it's working, okay? This padding 44 is working. But if I add a padding X, for example, two, and a padding Y, for example, three like that these two properties will have precedence over this one and it's not related to where 
they are placed okay so let me show you as you can see here well this take precedence over that but maybe it's because it's after so i'm just going to show you that it's not the case okay if i tag that and um, just do something like that to make sure it's really after as you can see there is no changes there's no changes because padding x and padding y take precedence over padding that's just css okay if you go and take a look inspect your select here you're going to see that here the style has been applied and if you look there i'm just going to make it bigger if you look there you can see that the padding 44 has been overridden by these two properties that's how css works okay some properties have precedence over other but that's not exactly what we want okay we want that if we send padding 44 from the parent we want to make sure that it's correctly overriding what exists even if there is already padding y and padding x so there is a library that allows you to do that and it's tailwind merge it's basically going to handle all the conflict and all the, the property that have precedence of the other and make sure that what you send is going to override what you have before okay so this uh, library is tailwind merge so we're going to install it you can go at the root of your project and just type npm i tw merge like that tailwind merge it's good i'm going to restart the project and i'm going to show you how it's super easy to use it I'm just going to import tailwind merge don't forget the curly braces from tw merge like that and this is a function and now you just have to take it like that it's a function you can call it and send it your entire so i'm just going to remove all of that set the p4 like it was previously and send the entire string okay and just to show you but now so for now i have something like that but if i have a px2 a py2 and then add here um a p45 like that as you can see it's working even if there is already the px and the py and as you can see here in the style they've been removed okay there there is only the py okay and as you can see it's not even in the string here okay so they've really been removed by tailwind merge it's going to try to make sense of uh, the properties you're sending and try to use the last one all the time okay so here i'm just going to set it like it was so p4 and now here i'm going to send my class name and now you're safe you're sure that no matter what you send it should technically work properly okay so here i'm going to send my wp1 and my wp1 here and yep it's still fine okay all right um so now let's work on the list in the next one and after that we will work on the dark mode so let's do that in the next one okay so now we're going to add a bit of spacing between all the items and we're going to create fake cart item okay well that's what we already have but now we're going to make sure that a product here also has a size and a quantity attached this way later if we want we can really add an item to the cart and specify a quantity and specify a size and it will be displayed correctly here okay so let's work on that okay so now we could start by creating a new component that is going to be cart.jsx so I'm going to remove that all right and I'm going to call my cart from my app so instead of displaying all of that here we're going to do that but in the cart and programmatically so here we'll have the cart and we're going to import it okay and no need for the cart item anymore so uh, the first thing is the cart is going to receive several cart items so it means that it's going to receive all the shoes okay but with each shoe we should attach a quantity and a size this way it's, it can be displayed in the cart 
So what we're going to do is we're going to create a fake cart items array. Okay, we're going to create a fake cart items like that. And it's going to be based on the shoe list. I'm going to map over my shoe list for each element. I will have a shoe here. And basically I'm going to construct a new array. Okay, I'm going to return I'm going to return a key that will be product and I'm just going to pass the entire shoe inside. And then I will also have a quantity for now. I'm just going to set one and I will have um, a size for now. I'm just going to set 44. So we will have in the end an array of that. Okay, all the shoes in product and a quantity and a size attached inside of the fake card items. Obviously later we will remove that. So now the cart could receive several cart items and I'm going to send these fake cart items like that. So it means that inside the cart here we are now expecting to receive some cart items. Now here, well again we're going to rewrite the h2 that we had previously, so I'm going to write cart. And here I'm just going to write a text for Excel, a font bold, and I'm going to add a bit of margin bottom, like that. So now, for now, we should be back to just that, yes. <clears throat> okay, now here we want to loop over the card items and display them. So uh, I'm going to create a UL. So first I'm going to create a UL. And here I'm going to map over my card items. So this will be a card item. And for each card item, I'm going to return return sorry an li. So in a loop, you always have to pass a key that is unique. So we're going to pass the card item um, dot product dot id. Okay. Because you remember this contains the product and the quantity and the size. And inside the li, I'm going to pass a cart item like that. Okay, so import cart item from cart item. And the cart item except what? Except item. Okay, so just the product. So for now, we're just going to pass the product like that. Okay, so let's see what we have. Yes, we have our element back. Cool. Now we want to add a bit of spacing between each element. So that's fine. We're just going to go under UL here and say that we want a space Y5. And ta-da, there is space between each items. Cool. Okay, now, uh, since we are now sending a real product uh, with the quantity and the size to the cart, maybe we can use the size and the quantity to display by default the real values in the inputs. So it means that we don't want to send only the product in the cart item here. We want to send the cart item because it contains also the quantity and the size. So now in the item here, we're going to grab the product, the quantity and the size. So now basically, uh, the product contains the source, the title, well, anything that was item is now product. So I'm going to go command D, command D, command D, and yes, everything is selected, and I'm going to replace that with product. If you're on Windows, it's uh, control D, I think. Uh, okay, so technically everything should be working or not. Cannot read properties undefined reading source. Um, okay, so yes, I didn't save it here, sorry. Okay, refresh, and yes, we're still back to what we had previously, but now inside the card item, we have access to the quantity and the size. And now what we could do is to send this quantity and this size as default value for the select. So the idea would be to be able to send something like that, default value, and then here send uh, the size and here default value send the quantity 
The thing is, we are not using default value inside select. So let's go in select. And here, we now can receive a default value. So now here, instead of setting all the time an empty default value, we're just going to set the default value that we receive here, okay? Or if there is nothing, we're going to keep using that. So let's refresh. Okay, so here nothing is broken. And here, yes, as you can see, we now have the values displayed in the inputs. So that's working. So now if we use real values later, it should be displayed correctly. Uh, we're just going to add a little bit of padding here because it's too close from the edge, in my opinion. So, so we're just going to go in card item, yes, here, and we're doing a padding one, and we're also going to add a padding left two, maybe, and a padding left two. And yep, that's better. Okay, great. So now I think we can say that on the Tailwind side, the project is pretty much over. Now we could add the dark mode support, okay? And after that, yes, I think that we are pretty much done. And if you want, after the dark mode, uh, this is not related to Tailwind, but we will make the, the card system really work with React, okay? So now let's work on the dark mode. Let's do that in the next one. All right, so in this video, we're going to set up the dark mode. So we're going to first add this button here uh, at the, the bottom right here. And when we're going to click on it, we're going to change. We're going to toggle dark mode. And we're also going to change the style of the button. So if I click, it's going to go like that. So with the sun and the background and the color are going to be inverted. And the idea is that technically, now if I refresh, I should keep in memory what is currently the dark mode, okay? And this button is using the dark mode itself to know which icon and which color it should display, okay? So if I refresh now, as you can see, we're still in dark mode, okay? And if I want to go back to the light mode, I just click and technically if I refresh, it's still there, okay? And technically this information should be stored in the local storage, okay? So let's do that. Okay, so first we're going to start by creating the button. So uh, we can maybe do that in app. Uh, and we're going to do that at the bottom of app. So we're going to create a div here. That is going to be a class name fixed. This way the button will never move and will always be at the same position. Uh, fixed, I'm going to set it at bottom four and uh, right four, like that. Then I'm going to create a button. So in this button, we will have an icon, and actually two icons that we're going to display or not depending on the dark mode. So we're going to have bi sun, and we'll have bi moon. Uh, and you can import these two from react icon slash bi. So we have something like that. Okay, so let's just add a bit of styling first. So um, maybe we could create a color for everything that is going to be dark in the application, okay? Uh, we can create two colors, actually. Uh, that's enough for the dark mode, I mean, for this application. Uh, and so in theme, in extend, we're going to create two colors. So I'm going to call this color uh, night. And inside we'll have 50, that will be 17E2C. Uh, and I forgot the one here, sorry. And we'll have the 500, uh, that will be 0D1120. And I'm going to set the 500 as default. So I'm going to copy that in default. Okay. So now that we have these colors, um, 
what we can do is set by default the BG Knight 50 as background color. Then we're going to add a bit of padding X for a bit of padding Y. Okay, we're going to make, make that rounded full. Okay, uh, we're going to change the, the color of the icon. So we're just going to set a text white. Yes, okay. Now, we want the sun to be displayed only when we are in dark mode. And otherwise, we want to display this one. So it means that by default, this one is hidden. Um, and when we go dark, we want it to be displayed. And this one, when we go dark, we want it to go hidden. Okay. Oh, oops. I wrote all of this uh, on the div, but actually, uh, I should put everything on the button directly. So like that, I can keep everything that is about position, but otherwise everything is going to be in the button. Like that. Okay. That's better. All right. So now we have the style for the button and technically if we go dark, they should toggle. Also, when we're going to go in dark mode here, we want the background to change to white and we want the text. So in dark, we want the text to go night, text night. Okay, so we cannot really see it right now. So when we click on the button, we want to toggle the dark mode. So you remember this is about changing a class in the HTML tag. So to be allowed to do that, we have to go in the Tailwind config and here below content, we have to use dark mode and tell that we can change the dark mode using a class like that. Now, when we're going to click on the button, we want to toggle this dark class. So we're going to create a function inside our app here that is going to be toggle dark mode. And it's just going to go at the window.document.document element, which refer to the HTML tag. And we're going to get the class list, all the classes, and we're just going to toggle the dark class. If it's not there, it's going to be there. And if it was there, it's going to be removed. Uh, okay, and now I'm just going to send this function to execute on click. Now let's try, if I click, yes, it seems to be working. Okay, I'm going to zoom a little bit so you can really see. Okay, it's working. Maybe we could add a bit of shadow just to make sure we see the button when it's in light mode. So I'm just going to add a shadow LG. Yes, that's better. Okay, so it seems to be working. Technically here the dark mode is changing because this is working. Cool, now maybe we want that to persist when we refresh the page. Okay, if I refresh, as you can see, even if I set the dark mode on and refresh, I lost everything. So basically what we want is to store somewhere if we are in dark mode or not. So what we're going to do is when we toggle the dark mode, we're going to check if in the class list here, dark is there. So we're just going to check if dark is there or dark is not there after we have toggle. Depending on that, we're going to write in the local storage and we're going to write that now the is dark mode is going to be true. And actually, it could be false if it's not there. So maybe we can just replace this if by something like that. Since this is equal to true or false. Okay. So here, after we have set the dark mode in the class, we just check, is it here 
If it is, then it's going to return true, otherwise it's going to return false, and we're just going to write that in the local storage. Okay, so we can check if it's working. So here I have opened the local storage. Okay, I'm just going to make it a little bit bigger. So for now we have nothing in the local storage. If I click, as you can see, is dark mode is now set to true. And if I click again, it's false. So it can have three values. Uh, if I refresh everything, as you can see, uh, by default, the value is it doesn't exist, so nothing, or it can be true, or it can be false. So now, when we are going to load the page the first time, we want to read that and then directly toggle or not the dark mode class. So we're going to create a function. So with React, you can use a function that is use effect. And you have to write it like that, pass a small array here. Um, and this is going to run only once when the application is going to start. So here, we're just going to make a check. We're going to get if we are in dark mode or not. So is dark mode is going to read the local storage. So we're going to get the is dark mode value. And now just depending on that, if is dark mode is equal equal to true, then it means we are in dark mode and then we, do, we want to add the class dark into the HTML. Otherwise we don't add anything and nothing will change. So here I'm just going to go window dot document dot document element dot class list again and here we're going to use the add and we're going to use dark okay we're going to add dark so this is going to be like the initialization of the dark mode so let's see if i refresh and i'm going to clear the local storage i'm going to refresh everything so by default we don't have anything we're still in light mode that's fine now if i click here we're moving to the dark mode. It's set in the local storage. And now if I refresh, as you can see, yes, it's reading the local storage and we keep this information. Perfect. Okay, so now the dark mode is completely set up and persistent. So now in the next video, we're going to update the entire application with some dark styling everywhere to make it dark proof. Okay, so let's do that in the next one. Okay, so let's update the dark styles. So let's start by the background. Uh, so we're going to go in app and on the very root div here, we're going to say that in dark, we want the BG to be night. And I'm going to toggle and okay. So now we have to update the rest. So let's start by the top, let's start by the uh, logo here. Um, so to do that, we can go in nav and the logo, the logo where it is, the logo, it's here. So to change the color, we have to use uh, the fill property for an SVG. So here, when it's dark, we're going to use the fill and we're going to fill it with white. And ta-da, it's working. So when I toggle, yes. Okay, now we want to make the, the entire menu white in dark mode. So let's go there. And here we just want to tell that here in dark mode, we want to make the text white. Yes, but is that working on mobile? So for now it's here. And no, not really. So we just want to do that on large screen. So let's just do that on large screen like that. So now if I do that, okay, the menu is still right here. Okay. Um, so as you can see, the burger menu is not there anymore. So we have to color it as well. So let's go burger. Yes, it's here. And we're just going to, in dark, set a text 
gray 400 this way we can see the logo and also when we're going to hover we're going to say that it's going to be bg gray 700 so we're going to add these two so let's save yes that's better okay and we have a slight hover here okay seems all right and when i open yes okay so everything here in the nav is fine okay now what about this one so let's go in the shoe detail okay so what do we want we want all the text to be white so here i'll just go with dark text white save and okay all the texts are white except we don't want these ones to be white so we have to override this um it's in the select okay so let's go in the select and in the select we want in dark the text to be black and we're good and the icon as well uh, the icon as well so maybe we can do that outside right here yes better so let's see if i click yes pretty cool okay uh, now we just have to do this section and actually only this text here so new arrivals i'm going to do a search for new arrivals yes it's right here and so here in dark i just want to have the text white and tada so nice uh, so it's working in dark mode but don't forget the sidebar it should as well be in dark mode so let's go in the cart so let's go in the sidebar and in the sidebar we want in dark to have a bg that is night like this yes okay but we don't see the text anymore in the title so let's go in cart here and here we're going to say that in dark we want the text to be white okay now this background is not super nice so, so maybe we can just remove this background uh, so let's go in the cart item and for now we have a BG gray so maybe in dark we're just going to do a BG transparent okay and we're just going to add an hover so in dark the hover uh, is still going to be this background oops I wrote it twice yes nice okay uh, now one issue we don't see the titles and we don't see the labels like that so we have to make sure that it's also working so for the title uh, the title in dark the text should be white yes and the labels also the labels are here so dark text white and here dark text white okay and sorry we still have the price and the trash here so again sorry uh, let's go into cart item the price should be dark text white and the trash where is the trash the trash is here in dark it should be text white okay I think we have everything uh, but as you can see here uh, the the hover is actually maybe not the right color because we don't really see the white text so we're going to change the color of that and we're not going to use this hover we're going to use the night 50 uh, so it's here And so, well, that is lighter, but at least we can see everything. 
Okay, very nice. Uh, now one last element, we forgot the button here. So let's go in the shoe detail and for the button add to bag. Well, when it's in dark, we want the BG to be white and when it's, and when it's in dark, we want the text to be black. And ta-da! Everything seems to be working fine. Okay, so here it is, we have finished the CSS, the Tailwind. And so technically through this project, you almost know everything you need to know to be able to create anything with Tailwind, okay? If you are able to create something like that, technically you saw almost everything that you need, okay? But obviously you can still learn other properties, other rules, on uh, the official documentation, but you have the fundamentals, okay? No need to extend for hours and practice again. Now you know how it's working and you can just practice by yourself by creating what you want, all right? So congratulations. Um, now, if you want, we can add some dynamism to the project and try to change the content that we have here depending on which card we select and then add the, the element to the cart for real, okay? And remove all of that. So this is purely React. So if you want to follow me, we're going to continue that in the next one, all right? See you and congratulations. Okay, so in this video, we're going to try to make this section dynamic. So when I'm going to click, so when I'm going to click, for example, on a card here, every detail should be replaced, okay? The title, the description, and the price and obviously the image, okay? So let's do that. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we are going to go in app. The idea is that we want the shoe detail to be able to receive some data to use them to display another shoe. Meaning that in the shoe detail, we want to be able to receive a shoe here, okay? So by default, what we're going to do is we are going to create a state here this is going to be the current shoe. And we're going to arbitrarily decide that the first shoe, it's going to be the first element of the shoe list, like that. Then we're just going to send the current shoe to the shoe detail. Now, the shoe detail can receive a shoe and we are just going to remove all the hard-coded data here by the real shoe information. So here, it's going to be shoe.title. Here, it should be shoe.price. Here, it should be shoe.description. Uh, yes, and the image, where is the image? Yes, it's here. Here we want to send the shoe dot source. So technically for now we shouldn't see any changes, but if I go in my app and just test and send another shoe, for example, the first one, as you can see, everything is replaced. So it's working fine. So now we want to do that programmatically. Okay, we want to be able to change the shoe. The function to update the shoe is this one. So what we want is to send it to the new ar arrivals section. This way we can pass this function to each card and then when we're going to click on the card, we're going to call this set current shoe with the current card data. So it means that here we could create, a, for example, an on click card. And here we're going to send the function set current shoe for new arrival section to be able to run it. Then inside here, it means that we have an on click card. And um, we actually want to send that again to each card. So here we're going to create um, an on click. And we're going to send the on click card like that. So this is still the set current shoe from app.jsx and so here it means that inside card we have on click props so here we have an on click 
and this unclick is still the set current shoe. So what we're going to do here is unclick. We're going to run a function that is going to call unclick and pass it the current item that is used in the card, and that's this item here. So we're going to use it. So technically, as soon as we're going to click on the card, we're going to call that, which is in app what we have sent here. This is going to be called, and this should update the current shoe. The component is going to refresh, to re-render, so the shoe detail is going to receive the new shoe, and it should update. So let's see. Yep, it's working fine. So we can now select a shoe. So a new step, and probably the last step, in the next one, we're going to try to add a shoe into the cart. Meaning that what we can do now is we can, um, here in cart items, remove the fake items. For now, I'm going to set an empty array, and we can remove the fake cart items that we have here. And we're going to replace them by real ones. Okay, so let's do that in the next one. Okay, so in this video, we're going to add an element to the cart. So first thing, we have to make sure that the inputs are correctly filled, okay? If I don't feel anything or if I forgot something, nothing should happen, okay? Now, if I add an element in my cart, okay, uh, it should appear in the cart with the correct values here for the size and the quantity. And uh, when I'm going to click again, it's not going to add three more uh, in the bag, okay? It's going to update the bag, okay? To prevent from having a lot of shoes, okay? We want to only be able to pass this kind of quantity and have this maximum quantity in the bag. So this will only update the bag now. So for example, here I have a size 44 and quantity three. So if I change here and add five, I will have only five in size 45 in the back, okay? And obviously I can add other shoes if I want by doing that, for example. And I should find all my elements in my back, all right? So let's work on that. Okay, so first thing first, we're going to go in app here and at the top, we're going to prepare the data for the cart, okay? So we will have a state that we're going to call cart items, and by default, it's going to be empty. And that is what we're going to send to the cart, okay? So everything is going to happen here. We have to update that, delete uh, data from the cart items, or add data in the cart items. So what we're going to do is we're going to already prepare the function that will be in charge of adding an element in the cart. So I'm going to create a function that will be add to cart, like that. And so this function is going to receive, well, a product, so a shoe, for example, and then a quantity and also a size. So first we have to check that we have indeed a quantity and a size, okay? Not just one or nothing. We want to make sure that we have both the quantity and the size. Then we have to first know if there is already an item in the cart, okay? So we're going to try to locate this item. So first we're going to try to see if there is an item that exists with this ID at some index in the array. So I'm going to go and go cart item dot find index. So it's going to loop. So for each element, I will have um, an item like that. And we just want to check if the item dot ID is equal equal to the product ID that we have here. So the product dot ID. Uh, and actually the, in the cart item, we're going to do like we did previously, we're going to add a dot product here. So as soon as we're going to find the matching element in the cart, we're going to have its index. And if the index is minus one, it means that it wasn't found. So we're going to check if, if the existing item index is greater 
than a minus one, meaning it's been found. There is already this item in the cart. If that's the case, then we want to update the quantity of our cart here. So we cannot do that directly in React, so we have to um, prepare an object that is going to be a copy of the cart item. So I'm going to create uh, an updated cart items that is just going to be anything that we have in cart items, like that. Now we can update that directly. So this is now the existing element in the cart. So if we are sending a new quantity and a new size for this product, well, we just want to update them with this value. So here, I'm just going to say that the quantity here is going to become a quantity, and I'm going to do the same thing with the size. And that's good, we just want to update that. Otherwise, it means that the element does not exist yet, so we want to add it in the, in the card. So I'm just going to do updated card item dot push. And here, I'm going to send a product. So the product will be, well, the product that we have here. For the quantity, we're going to set the quantity that we have here. And for the size, we're going to set the size that has been sent. And we can make a short end for that. When the value and the key are the same, we can just remove one of them. Like that. Now, at the end of this if statement, technically the updated card items is ready to be sent in the state to update the state. So here I'm just going to do set card items and I'm going to send the updated card items like that. Now, who's going to run that? Well, technically that is the button right here that is going to run that using the values that we have here and the data for the shoe that we have here. So it's in shoe detail, meaning that this function should be sent to shoe detail. So here, I'm going to create an, an on click add and I'm going to send the function so it can run it. Now let's go in shoe detail. In shoe detail, now I have an on click add. And basically when I click on the button here on click, I want to call the on click add. And here I'm supposed to send the product, the quantity and the size. So for the product, well, we already have it here. That's the shoe that we have. But now for the quantity and the size, uh, well, it's only known from the select here. Okay, only the select here know what is the size and what is the quantity. So we're going to store that here to be able to send it here. So we're going to create two states, one for the size and one for the quantity. Or maybe instead of creating two states, we can just create one form like that. And here we're going to create an object with quantity null and um, size null. And don't forget to uh, import the use state. So technically in the end here, we should send the form dot quantity and the form dot size but we still don't have that updated. So it means that we have to create a function in the, in the select so the select can run the set form. So here we're going to create an onChange and we're going to send it a function that receives here a quantity and that is going to do a set form use everything that was produced in the form and just update the quantity with the new one. Okay, and we're going to do the same thing, but for the size. So here it's going to be size and here size. So now we have to code this unchange in the select. So let's go into select, create an unchange here. And now technically unchange on the select, here we have access to the event and we just want to call onChange with the e.target.value, which is the current value in the select. Okay, so we're calling 
here the function with the value and so behind the scene we're calling with this value here that is going to be sent here and here okay okay so technically now we should have the correct value from the select it's going to update the state and no and now technically the onclick add should work so uh let's see if it's working i'm just going to go in app and console log the cart items to see how it evolves cart items okay so uh refresh okay everything is fine so if i select 2 and 43 add to bag so yes seems like we have the correct quantity the correct size for the correct product and what do we have here? Well, it seems like we have what we want. Uh, it's working, okay. And if I set one instead, add to bag. Yep, seems like the data are good. And if I open here, well, it's good, but as you can see now, this has not been updated. Why is that? Well, because for now, for the input, we're just using the default value. And so the default value is not updated, okay? You send the default value and then it stays the default value forever. So we have to change how the select is handled. So it means that now the select is not going to receive a default value, but a value because we want to be able to update it from above. So here, we're going to receive a value like that. We're going to send the value here remove the default value. Uh, if there is no value, we'll still put something like that inside. And so now it means that in the shoe detail, uh, and actually in all the select of the application, we have to send a value now. So here, well, the value is going to be what has been selected uh, here. So that should be form.quantity. And here it should be form.size. But that's not it. We have to do the same thing in the cart. So let's go in the cart. Uh, in the cart item. Here we have some select. Okay. And now we're not going to use default value, but just value. So let's see if it's working or not. So uh, if I try to add something here, it's not working because I haven't set both a quantity and a size. If I add it, oh, nothing happening. Yes, okay, maybe I, I remove the log. If I set three and 43 and add to bag, yes, it's updated, so it's working, okay? If I set 44, yes, it's updating correctly. Cool. Uh, so I think we are done for the add. Maybe you could work on the remove in the next video. Okay, so in this video, we're going to work on the remove. So that's pretty simple. When we click on the trash, we want the item to be removed from the cart. So let's work on that. So a bit like we did with the add to cart, we're going to go in app and uh, it's going to be easier because uh, almost everything is done now but we're going to create a remove from cart and we're going to remove an element using its id since it's supposed to be unique so here we're going to expect a product id now like we did previously we're going to do the same thing as we did here we're going to copy the cart items like that to be able to modify it safely without conflicting with the state system of React. Um, then we're going to try to find this element. So exactly like we did for the add, we're going to try to find the element, okay? And here it will just be the product ID. So now we have the index. So what we can do is we can just look at the array and then just remove the element that is at the index index is going to be removed and then we want the array to uh, close around this 
So now what we want is just to remove the element that is at this index, okay, without leaving an empty space in the array. So to do that, we have a function that we can use on an array that is slice. And we can tell that we want to um, remove exactly one element and we have to specify at which index, and that's pretty simple, it's at the index that the element has been found. Now, technically, we have removed the element from the updated card items. Now we just have to update the state. So we're going to do a set card items and send the updated card, card items. Like that. Now, who's going to run this remove from cart? Well, technically, it's supposed to be uh, the, the trash icon that is in the cart. Okay. So this is in a cart item. So it means that we have to send the remove from cart to, 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 to the cart. So we're going to create an, an onclick uh, trash here, and we're going to send the function to execute it. Then in the cart, we're going to receive an onclick trash. So here we're receiving an onclick trash, and we want to send that uh, again to the cart item, like that. Uh, and then inside the card item, we're going to use it. So here we're receiving the function again on click trash. And now on the trash icon, on the button actually, when we click, we want to run a function that is going to call on click trash, which is just basically what we sent from app uh, here. So basically the function we just wrote this. We want to execute it, and so we have to send the product ID. And that's pretty simple. I think we have the product here. Yes, we have the product. So that's perfect. We just have to send the product.id. Make sure to save all your files, refresh your application, add one element, or maybe two or three. Yes. Okay, and I'm going to remove the one in the middle. Oh, something's wrong. Okay, what's happening? Mm-hmm. Why isn't that working? So, uh, is the function called correctly? Yes, it's called. Um, what did I do? Oh, I use slice, but it's splice. Sorry, that's not the same thing. Splice, yes. Uh, now it should work. So now if I click, yes, it's removing the item. Okay, so it seems like we are done with the application. Congratulations. So you can be proud, congratulations, and see you in the next video.